Oh, well, good evening. Um, my name is Christian Klein. I'm the chair of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals. I'd like to call this meeting of the board to order. Um, I'd like to confirm that all members and anticipated officials are present. Uh, Roger DuPont. Here. Patrick Hanlon. Pat is, I can see Pat. Here. Kevin Mills. I can see Kevin. Aaron Ford. Here. Here. Stephen Revelack. Here. John O'Rourke. Here. Wonderful. Uh, from the town, I know Rick Valerelli is here. Uh, Vincent Lee, I see, is here. Um, I saw Emily Sullivan is here from the, uh, the Planning Department Conservation Commission. Um, good. Um, uh, Paul Haverty is here from BBH. Uh, Marty Nover is here from Beta Group with her team. Um, and Stephanie Kiefer is here representing the applicant. All right. So this open meeting of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals is being conducted remotely consistent with Governor Baker's executive order of March 12th, 2020. The order suspends the requirement of an, the open meeting law to have all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. Further, all members of public bodies are allowed and encouraged to participate remotely. Public bodies may meet remotely so long as reasonable public access is afforded so the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. An opportunity for public participation will be provided during the public comment period during each public hearing. For this meeting, the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals has convened a video conference via the Zoom app with online and telephone access as listed on the agenda posted to the town's website identifying how the public may join. This meeting is being recorded and it is being broadcast by ACMI. Please be aware that attendees are participating by a variety of means. Some attendees are participating by video conference. Other participants are participating by computer audio or telephone. Accordingly, please be aware that other folks may be able to see you, your screen name or another identifier. Please take care not to share personal information. Anything you broadcast may be captured by the recording. We also ask you to maintain decorum during the meeting, including displaying an appropriate background. All supporting materials have been provided members of this body are available on the town's website unless otherwise noted. The public is encouraged to follow along using the posted agenda. As chair, reserve the right to take items out of order in the interest of promoting an orderly meeting. Um, the first item on our agenda this evening is the uh, approval of the minutes from the January 12, 2021. Um, <clears throat> those meetings, those minutes were distributed by Rick to the members of the board. And I know there were some comments, I believe, that came back on that. Um, are there any additional comments beyond those that were already submitted? No. Seeing none. Um, can I have a motion to approve the minutes? So moved. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. A second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Mills. So a quick roll call vote. Mr. DuPont? Aye. Mr. Hanlon? Aye. Mr. Ford? Aye. Mr. Revlack? Aye. Mr. Mills? Aye. Mr. O'Rourke? And the chair goes aye. So thank you all. Uh, it's hard. Next item, uh, number three, is the approval of the decision for, <clears throat> excuse me, docket 3641, 69 Epping Street. Um, this was put together by uh, Patrick Hanlon. Um, members were had an opportunity to submit comments, and I believe those were all incorporated. Mr. Hanlon sent around a final copy this afternoon. Are there any additional comments on what was already an exemplary set of decisions? Seeing none. Let's do a quick roll call again. Mr. DuPont? Aye. Mr. Hanlon? Aye. Mr. Ford? Aye. Mr. Rolak? Aye. Mr. Mills? Aye. Mr. O'Rourke? Aye. I miss, did I miss anyone? Oh, there it is. OK. Which brings, okay, so that is the last of the administrative items. Uh, now turning to the comprehensive permit hearing for Thorndike Place. 
I want to review some ground rules for effective and clear conduct of tonight's business. This evening's discussion <clears throat> will focus on the architectural and urban design aspects of the submitted materials. Those documents are available on the ZBA's Thorndike Place website. We'll open this evening with an introduction to the building and site design and amenities. The board will then discuss its questions with the applicant before we open the hearing to public comment and questions. So with that, um, we'll turn this over to uh, Ms. Kiefer. Hi, thank you. Uh, good evening, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. Um, and those for those individuals that are um, watching this evening's uh, ZBA hearing that haven't previously participated, my name is Stephanie Kiefer and I'm counsel to the um, applicant Arlington Land Realty, um, serving as their permitting counsel. And with us here this evening, we have a number of members from our project team again, um, some of them very familiar to you. Uh, we have John Heshed from BSC, we have Bob Angler from SEB, um, but we also have this evening, um, and our presenters um, will be Gwen Noyes and Art Klipfell from Oak Tree Development, um, Greenstacks, um, together with um, Scott Blasick of Bruce Hamilton Architects in uh, New Ipswich, New Hampshire, um, working with them. <clears throat> And when we last appeared before the board um, earlier this month, as you may recall, the presentation uh, focused on uh, transportation and traffic issues, um, during which our, our traffic engineer from VAI, Scott Thornton, um, presented uh, his traffic impact study. Um, and then the um, beta peer review presented as well as we heard from the, the TAC, Mr. Muse. Um, subsequent to that hearing, I'm just taking care of a few housekeeping matters here. Um, subsequent to that, um, the NES on January 15th submitted its response to the bulk of Beta's traffic comments. Um, and there were just a, a few issues that BSC was addressing on the, on the traffic peer review. Those were submitted um, on January 25th, um, um, together with um, the comments on Beta's peer review and the, and the town engineer comment, uh, pardon me, um, Beta submitted BSC submitted um, the, the kind of the extra responses, I think one through nine of the traffic. Um, and it likewise on the 25th submitted um, responses to beta's peer review vis-a-vis uh, -vis stormwater management. And then also incorporating some comments um, on that same topic made by the town engineer um, together with its updated stormwater report. Um, and then also we submitted a fiscal impact assessment um, report prepared by Fougere. Um, and lastly, uh, BSC submitted revised wetlands delineation memo and updated site plan sheets. Um, let me make certain I have these right. Sheets C100, 101, 105, C200, and C203. Um, I present that just as a, a matter of housekeeping just to update you what's been submitted since the last hearing. Thank you. Um, no. Um, and on to this evening's hearing, um, as, you, as you stated, our focus this evening is architecture and urban design. Um, mm -hmm. And it's our understanding that there has been no peer review um, that the board has um, have performed with, with that. Um, and our presentation this evening is going to be in the very capable hands of um, Gwen Noyes and Art Klipfel um, and with the assistance of uh, Scott Blasick. Um, and they're going to walk you through the, uh, the building layout, its architectural features, as well as the design features that have um, been, been, you know, brought, brought to bear and revised through this process to, to weave the building and its tenants into the Arlington, Arlington community and, and this very neighborhood. Um, and just as a reminder, and I'm sure you're all aware, the site is approximately 17 plus acres and the the multifamily housing um, consists of 176 dwelling units. So when one looks at that, um, obviously part of this is we're proposing that it be preserved for conservation in a large chunk, but it, it works out to about 12 dwelling units per acre on the overall, which is um, pretty modest in terms of multifamily housing. Um, and before I get too much out of my lane, I'm going to turn it over to the professionals to present to you um, the architectural features and, and the uh, urban design elements of this. Thank you. So I think she meant it was coming to me. I'm Gwen Noyes. I'm a partner with Arthur of Oak Tree Development. 
And um, I've had the honor and the task of working on this project for many years. <laughs> so we're, we're carrying it on. At this point, I'm going, to, I'm going to read my presentation because I think it'll go more smoothly and I won't make as many mistakes. But um, so forgive me while I have a script here that I prepared. At this point in our 220, 221 project review process, there's a bit to share with you that doesn't require graphics, but just some introductory comments. I'd also like to take the opportunity to express some gratitude for this current process and its participants. This is hard work for all of us. And we're told that the CEBA would like us to tackle, would, would like to tackle some other work too. So we're gonna try to help you move this along uh, so we can wrap it up <laughs> as soon as we can. Um, a note, my partner Arthur uh, has recently had some uh, voice issues and compromised his voice, so we're sparing his voice a bit so he can talk later um, about the proposed building plans and the exterior architecture. So I'm reducing, uh, introducing us uh, and the site and the landscape characteristics. But it appears that this may be our only opportunity to express some gratitude for this last project uh, project chapter of our work so uh, that so many citizens of Arlington have participated in. So I'm going to take a minute or so for that. Our team's thanks go to, the, to you, the planning board, the zoning board, sorry, of appeals, construction, constructive attentiveness to the project over the several meetings that we've had with you. We're also grateful for the Conservation Commission and the Traffic Commission who have spent hours meeting with us to review the, the project and write letters about it. The Arlington Planning Department has also been engaged as, the legal, as their legal counselors and other staff, um, and they've been weighing in at critical junctures. So we appreciate that. And the town's peer review consultant, Beta, has provided constructive second looks at our environmental, civil, and traffic work. All of this has been very productive and practical. Thank you, all of you. Uh, and now some thanks to our team over the past year, in particular, all of the just mentioned entities have deliberated with us and offered many recommendations that have enabled us to improve our proposal. Then, a distinctly COVID and Zoom experience for all of us, and we've managed to come a long way. The local regulations and complexities of 40B zoning have been worked through with Stephanie Kiefer's dedicated and brilliant guidance, when, along with Bob Angler of SEB, whose seasoned wisdom and experience have been totally invaluable. And throughout a very extensive and thorough civil and, and environmental investigation, and then at the design process, we've been working very closely with the totally capable Boston consulting firm and specifically with the very able John Hessian, who's there on the bottom of your screen, at least on ours, um, and his extensive and professional team has produced a mountain of critically valuable data, drawings, date details and reports, all of it accurate. Um, the, the traffic investigation and replanning with, um, uh, with Vanessa's experienced professional, Scott Thornton, uh, it was, that's where we got our traffic in, uh, information. He's, he's provided much work and many hours to address the traffic challenges of this area in Arlington, but we're not addressing those tonight and we've given him a break from being on the Zoom with us all. So there's, there's more. <laughs> My partner Arthur and I are about to present the project's architecture. We're presenting our, our own firms, uh, Oak Tree and, uh, and Greenstack, as well as our architect, uh, our associate architect, Scott Vlasic, who's also on the screen, Bruce um, uh, of Bruce Hamilton Associates. He and his associates have been working tirelessly with us to produce the architectural graphics. And of course, we're all here because the Mugar family owns the land and is optimistic that this very capable team that I've just gone through will at last reach a housing solution that will admirably serve the community 
and will also bring a substantial piece of land into, into the community, benefiting a conservation mode of, of use. The family's stated desire is to deed the excess land beyond Thorndike Place to the town or a community entity for future conservation improvement. So what's important now is that we are about to present to you this evening a housing proposal that we are confident would serve the larger Arlington community as well as the immediate neighborhood. As I said, we will not dwell at this time on traffic concerns. We appreciate that they are very real and Scott Thornton has been working with the Traffic Advisory Committee and Beta to address the challenges of Lake Street and all the surrounding and, and the surrounding streets. And so enough of that right now. We will instead focus on how Thorndike Place will provide much needed housing, especially for seniors that is in short supply in Arlington. Thorndike Place addresses several of the needs mentioned in the Arlington Planning Office's studies over the years. This high quality new housing would especially alleviate the historic shortage of, of affordable housing in Arlington. Very importantly, all of the proposed 176 units would count towards Arlington's quota for affordable housing. Your community does not need reminding that Arlington has been historically way low, below Massachusetts municipal requirements for affordable housing and has added only a few units for years. So now we're gonna go to some something visible, visual. And uh, Scott, I'm gonna ask you to put on the first slide, which is the perspective. Sure. I will uh, share my screen here. Uh, so I think I just need um, uh, permission to do that. Uh, so I am I am ready. Rick, can you go ahead and take care of that? Scott, you good to you uh, good to go right now, Scott? Okay, thank you. Yes. So this this first slide shows the scale and relative placement of our proposal along Dorothy Road. Okay. I'm going to share a few points about Thorndike uh, with just this drawing on the screen that our other drawings at the scale and level of development don't convey. The following are important qualities that uh, of, Thor of Thorndike Place, uh, some of which you've heard before. So I'm just going to list them point by point. Thorndike Place will be within a few minutes walk of a bike ride or a bike ride to the AOFT, enabling many residents to avoid car commuting. It's within walking distance of Mass Avenue and AOF offices and many commercial and retail operations. Thorndike Place will provide a blue bike station on a sunny corner of our property for more electric bikes. A transit screen in our lobby will inform residents of public transportation timing. All these things are meant to emphasize its convenience to public transportation. Thorndike Place will be built to high energy, uh, energy efficient standards. Just a few of the things that we can uh, assure you will be there. It will be a lead silver equivalent, uh, all energy efficient and heat pump heating and cooling uh, high levels of heat and sound insulation, water save, saving plumbing, color corrected light, lead, LED lighting, uh, non off gassing building materials, energy efficient appliances, a state of the art security communication and safety equipment, all those things that will make it a safe and, and good place for people to live. It would have a water retaining roof that would attenuate heavy rainstorm runoff and reflect heat away from the roof. It would be built with modules that will shorten the site's construction disruption, improve construction quality, and shorten construction duration by about five months. Uh, and that's when compared to conventional construction periods. Prefabricated module deliveries to the property would come 
the minimal distance from Route 2, and at times that the contractor and the Arlington Building Department would work out together. As you know, when we started this new Thorndike 2020 chapter a year ago with, with a site plan and project that was expansively stretched over the property and had 219 units and over 300 parking spaces, much of its surface, the, the project's design elements made incursions into edges of sensitive landscape. And we have a, a shot of what that project, just to remind you what that looked like. So Scott's going to put that on the screen too. Oh, no, that's the wrong one, Scott. It's the older one that, that had the... That's that it. one, it's that one, yeah. So that's what we were talking about over a year ago. 219 units. 219 units and... Um, some some housing along the street and uh, and if you can look very carefully you can see that there were a number of places where we were in in wetland area so uh, and there's a lot of surface park parking um, this is where we came from in, re in redesigning the proposal we're about to present it was spread out it had lots of grade parking and it was in sensitive areas so we're going to we're going to take that off the screen. It was just there to sort of remind you where we came from when we did our redesign. We think we have a better plan now. And uh, this is showing the, the site plan um, as, as we're currently showing it. And it has 176 units, not 219. So that's a considerable uh, reduction in, in size from that standpoint. We listened to your concerns about the size and spread and moved the building with a new configuration to raised ground that is closer to the street. We introduced three-story street elevations and side and street side courtyard configurations to respect the existing scale of the Dorothy Road homes. We brought in one of the most highly respected civil engineering firms that I've already mentioned to you, the uh, BSC with, with John Hessian. We devised a compact design to accommodate 176 apartments as well as a community room, exercise room, bicycle storage, and various landscaped courtyards. We stepped back the building in pieces that reflect the scale of the neighborhood. We laid out more compact buildings, a, a more compact building form that accommodates almost all the parking underground with some zoning compliant parking counts that we're willing to trim back at the request of the TAC, but we haven't done that yet. That's negotiation for a waiver. Um, we we placed the spine of, build, of the building and four stories 75 feet back from the street and planned landscape and uh, uh, the, the entire length of the street with with shrubs and street trees. There are four different courtyards, each one with a unique character. And I'm maybe Scott can use his cursor. I'm going to start with the, the landscaped main courtyard, which is in the, the, the call it the northwest courtyard that has the upper pavement right. in it upper on the right. upper so upper left of the building there. Um, that um, that one is the main public entry courtyard. And it has uh, space for short term parking, visiting bicycles, which we're going to identify the stands for. Um, and guests would be able to have short term parking there. Um, uh, and then the, on just south of that, facing the, the woods, is a sunny social courtyard that, that it goes right off the entry and the, and the community room. And uh, it would be a place where you could have games or activity, uh, par small parties, uh, and and there's a view south over the over the woods, and uh, of course out to Route Two that direction. And then there's another courtyard, that we'll call it the the northeast courtyard, that is right off a bunch of several units um, that are on the ground floor and second and uh, third floor, and that would be a quiet. Uh, courtyard 
uh, that would stay cool in the summer and cooler in the summer and and be a place you could sit under a tree and read a book or or chat with you with a friend it would be so that would be a meditative kind of a courtyard and then south of that where there's some sort of uh, purplish trees that's what we would be, would be um, it could be a rain garden it just, it's it's in the floodplain we left the floodplain there and it would be a place where uh, there could be wildflowers and and uh, native native trees brought in to, to enliven that. Um, and and well, that's John. Uh, we, this is this is where uh, where we've kept some of the the uh, flood plane that that we don't have to do a two for one kind of a replacement for because we have it. So there will be easy access to the street level parking from a number of, uh, for, uh, for a combination of visitor and, and resident parking. Um, that's, uh, that's the, the parking lot that's up, up on, the, um, on the upper left there. And again, if, if the negotiation about parking involves cutting back the number of parking spaces, one of the first places we would take it away is uh, on the northern end of that parking lot where the neighbor is a little concerned about how close the parking is. We, we could take away uh, several spaces there and put in a buffer of trees that would give a little more um, space between that neighbor's property and, and the parking lot. Um, that would be at least 25 feet. The residential building is set back 23 feet from the street, similar to uh, what is often the spacing of the houses down the street. Um, there are quite a few that are even closer than that. There is a pedestrian walk and a porously paved uh, fire road that wraps around the south and east of the building. Um, and it's ADA accessible and provides access to and from the courtyard and to the children's playground. The playground is in the southeast um, corner of the property. And uh, that would be uh, there as an amenity for the families in the building. And it has this sunny exposure all day long. There would be bicycle access to and from the building. Uh, there's a special door at the end of the building where it goes out to the, the fire lane, and uh, that would be where um, uh, bicycles could come and go very efficiently from Dorothy Road. And then of course, uh, part of what we haven't uh, had further discussions about, but we're often asked, won't there be some way to go across the property to uh, more directly to the bicycle path? And uh, that's something we're open to, but there hasn't been any negotiation or specifics about that. And that's a process that we're willing to undertake uh, whenever. Um, the bicycle provisions that uh, everything where we ever, where we have bicycles, we've got plenty of parking for them in the basement and, and some on the, sec on the ground floor near the entry. So bicycles would be um, honored parts of our, of our plan and uh, the security and use of it would be um, eased at, at every, uh, option that we we have um, with with good sturdy stanchions etc. There's wheelchair access from the neighborhood to the conservation area that would come also along the the uh, the fire lane that would have a walking uh, part <laughs> um, along there <clears throat> that would be accessible from from the neighborhood also. Um, the, uh, as Stephanie mentioned earlier, the property, you're only seeing a small portion of the property in this slide. Uh, we may be using something in the neighborhood of five acres uh, with this, this layout, which leaves 12 acres for conservation and community use. Um, and that would be something that would be negotiated with the community and and um, and uh, we believe that the Thorndike owners and management uh, uh, would be very 
engaged and helpful uh, and contributing over the years for that. So that's the site overview. Um, and uh, now my partner who's been sitting patiently beside me uh, is going to talk about the architecture um, pieces of the building that, that uh, I have not addressed yet. So here he is, Arthur Clipsfell. Uh, <laughs> good evening, good evening. Uh, so thank you all for listening to us here. Uh, I think, uh, why don't we go to the ground floor plan, uh, Scott? So this building shape and form, I think coming back to some things that Gwen said, uh, we, as, as we cut back on the number of units from 219 to 176, uh, we obviously could contract the, uh, the building footprint. And uh, as part of that, we, uh, we were able to minimize the, the floodplain issue, uh, the impact on the floodplain, a negative impact uh, to very low numbers and also uh, have almost completely avoided the uh, incursion on the wetlands. So what we have tried to do, given the goal of doing that, of being a better uh, neighbor there with the, with the overall 17 acres, We've tried to mitigate uh, the impact of the building along uh, Dorothy Street, okay. Dorothy Road. And to do that, you can see the courtyards are actually back uh, 75 feet from the road. And the, uh, the wings that come out toward the road are back, as Gwen mentioned, 23 feet. Uh, and what that really means is that only 50% of the, the project length is actually on the road. Everything else is set back. So 50% is set back and 50% is is uh, actually out to within 23 feet, just so you'll see that a little later in a section. Now, uh, can you zoom in, Scott, on the, uh, the entryway? we we'll just go through that quickly. Uh, I think, oops, it isn't loading. There we are. So you can see where the entry door is, and uh, Gwen uh, introduced you to the, to the uh, courtyard uh, in front, the turnaround. And uh, you can see there, there's a fitness area, a common area, uh, mail room is a big thing, package room, uh, marketing room. And then off to the right, right next to the entry is a bicycle room. And we'll talk a little bit more about bicycles. We're going to have uh, just outside that door from the bicycle room, uh, coming toward the marketing room, there's outdoor spaces for about 20 units. Uh, we didn't put that in, 20 uh, bicycle stands. Mm -hmm. Uh, for visitors and that sort of thing. Again, right by the entrance door uh, where Scott is uh, pushing his cursor. Uh, so the basic layout obviously is entering from the, uh, from the courtyard. Uh, when you're in the lobby, one of the nice things about the lobby is it opens out to the south, the south courtyard. And as Gwen mentioned, that, that courtyard will be uh, nicely landscaped, places, you know, tables with umbrellas and nice things for people to enjoy the sun because that's the sunny side. And if you move to the right a little bit from the lobby, you'll see the two elevators going up into the building. Um, the, uh, the access to bike storage, that stairway is only one floor, goes down to the garage, so you can't walk to the garage. Scott, you wanna put your cursor on that? Right, no, the one in the lobby is the one, that's only one floor. Just goes down to the garage and to the bikes. Um, so I think that's it for that floor. Let's go up to the next floor which is a typical floor. Now, what we did do here uh, <clears throat> to kind of show you how we laid the building out, you can see the elevators coming up. The, uh, the, the units along um, Dorothy Road, uh, the two to the right are the three, three uh, bedroom units. And then there's one off to the left. It's a little hard to distinguish those colors at this scale, but that's sort of an orange. The blue coloring is a two bedroom. The uh, red coloring, which is a little bit dim, those are studios. And the one bedrooms are, uh, I believe, yellow. Uh, and the, there are uh, in the second courtyard, the courtyards to the right, at this level, there are uh, four ADA units, two ones and two uh, twos. And that's those arrows. Uh, when you look at the drawings and you get a set of drawings, you'll see that there are four ADA units. Well, that's good, Scott. You, you can bring, bring us in on that. Around. And why don't you look at the three bedroom units? Scroll down a little bit. Those are the threes. 
Let's blow up a two, show a two, typical two. That's an inside corner two, that's fine. And then there are also quarter units that are twos. Um, there's a quarter two on the left. And this way, to make it whole, why don't you show a studio and a one just to get a sense of what the units are. There are two studios side by side, as you can see, it's red. And right next to it is a one, as you can see, is a yellow. So not fairly typical units. Uh, I think it's worth mentioning that the 25% affordable would have exactly the same unit design, unit specification as the uh, market rate units. That's our intention here. And uh, there, there we've done these units and other projects. These are all, I think another thing you might uh, want to think about or notice is that they're laid out as module construction. The modules are 62 feet long and 13 feet wide. So you can see how they cross corridors. Uh, Scott, you can cursor that maybe and show how the 62 feet crosses a corridor or well, there's 62, it's got a dimension out there. So let's look at the fourth floor plan. Now this shows the setback. And this is, again, uh, this is a big building. We're not trying to say it isn't, but we've done our very best uh, given the need to, to uh, bring this building up to this piece of land in a way to, uh, to diminish as much as possible its impact on wetlands and floodplain storage. So you can see where we've cut back the fourth floor. Uh, those are those white areas. And uh, I think the note on there, Scott, says uh, what stormwater storage, but uh, storm retention, uh, we may have use there of uh, some PVs or whatever, uh, TBD to be determined. And then the dotted line there, the eight foot tennis use, tenant use limit. Uh, we were asked to do that. We were asked to uh, not allow tenants. You can see there's a corridor going down to what would be a, uh, a balcony or could be a balcony. And we agreed to keep our tenants back away from the edge, uh, thinking that they might be making noise in the neighborhood or whatever. So uh, we would accept some kind of uh, use limit there. Uh, so let's look at the garage plan, Scott. So this is, uh, I won't spend too much time on this, but you can see the, uh, the dark lines there. Show the bicycles, uh, Scott. There we go. Those are rows of bicycles. Uh, we may have more space for bicycles uh, if we do take out some of the parking, which is a possibility at this point. Uh, but we do have... Um, Let's see, we have uh, 205 spaces in the garage. I have some notes here. Uh, and then 26 are in the exterior lot on the west that Gwen pointed out to you where we may pull that back a little bit away from the neighbor's uh, land and plant some trees. And then eight are actually at the entry. So the total number of parking spaces is 239. As I say, 205 are in the garage. Um, now, 20% of these to need to be compact or can be compact. So we're taking uh, that, and I believe that's your local regulation on that. So we'll abide by that. 20% or 47 spaces will be compact. And we also dimensionally will pay attention to the regulations, which are um, 8.5 for uh, by 18 for a regular space, and uh, compacts are 8 feet by 16. So. Um, that's all according to regulations, unless there's some kind of uh, uh, interest in the in the city in uh, in, in uh, cutting back on the parking that, that was mentioned in one of the uh, responses we got to the plans. Why not cut back the parking a little bit? And we have seven ADA spaces. That's right. We have seven ADA spaces, which I think you can see. That that's all by code. Everything is down there is by uh, by code. The bikes are not by code, but. Um, uh, this gives us a ratio of, of bikes to uh, people. There are 105, uh, I guess, yeah, 105 bike spaces in the garage, uh, 36 uh, inside by the lobby, which of course are the handiest, uh, and then 16 spaces outside by the entrance doors. A total of 160 spaces for 176 units. Um, the uh, so there's a, there's a space for every a bike space for every unit. Almost. Um, okay, Scott, let's go to the next. Uh, 
so this, we, we were asked to uh, show some context of the abutting uh, existing buildings. Uh, so this is, we, we've done that on the two streets, Little John Street, and uh, of course this is Dorothy, Dorothy Road. And uh, what we've tried to do, that last house, there is a brick house, and there are several houses that have brick uh, facades or whatever. Uh, and so we've, we've, in the elevation, and uh, you can see we're, we're showing the, uh, you can see the three elements that come out to within 23 feet of the street. And they all have that, uh, that brick red element, which is lowered. And uh, we're, we're doing this to lower the scale of that elevation to, uh, uh, it's a big building and uh, we're not trying to pretend it isn't, but we're trying to do everything we can by uh, cutting back that fourth floor along the street, by having that, uh, the bulk of the building back, 50% uh, of it anyhow, back 75 feet. Uh, with the, the piece with that, uh, that red uh, siding is uh, back 23 feet, as we mentioned. And uh, we, we were also asked, we're still working on that a little bit to uh, go to the courtyard, Scott, and uh, scroll right to the courtyard, can you? A little bit more. So there, that's the actual entrance and uh, we're going to work on that. You can see the canopy coming out. You can see, uh, you know, we're, we're doing, uh, got some cables on the edge and all that kind of good stuff to uh, to really mark that entrance. And we were asked to do that, to, to uh, use color and, uh, and textures to, uh, to make that entrance stand out. So that was our response to that. Uh, so let's go to the next slide, Scott. Did uh, you, you want to back out on that just to make sure everybody's seen that? No, go back. I'm sorry. Go back to uh, Dorothy Road. The, uh, what, what the Scott and his crew did is they put the plan, as you can see, under the building. So you can see the, uh, where the uh, abutting units are. Those are, those are real plans. Uh, these were photoshopped out of uh, the, the, the elevations themselves were taken out of Google. They, uh, so those elevations are correct. And uh, the plan itself, you can see, uh, Gwen mentioned the, uh, the landscape courtyard, which would be very quiet. Put your cursor on that, uh, Scott. And then the entrance courtyard. Now the entrance courtyard, we are taking out two cars uh, there. So that, there'll be a little bit more walkway around that courtyard. Uh, and, and that's in our count. We're counting only six cars there. This drawing shows eight cars and we just haven't adjusted that yet. So go ahead, Scott. So this is uh, uh, Little John Street. And uh, we thought we should do this just to show the other street. I think somebody asked to see that. Uh, this shows, you can see the width of the street. You can see again, the plan below, there's the width of the street and the sidewalk, uh, some landscaping along there. Now, uh, the, the furthest wing way to the right, that's uh, faded out a fair amount because that's actually uh, the third wing way to the east end of the building. So the, the actual building that faces uh, is, is that dimension right there that Scott's uh, outlining. And I think it's worth saying, you know, I've talked about that, uh, that lower brick colored band. As soon as you come around that corner, there's a, uh, a lower band that, that complements the size of the houses across the street. Uh, we might want to bring that band all the way around this corner as well. I don't know. That's we're still doing uh, various architectural studies. Um, so uh, I think you can go to the next one. I guess the next one is a section. No, that's so. That's the east and west elevation uh, at. Scott, did we miss the uh, east and west? Huh. Sorry, Art, I, I can go to whichever one you want. You mentioned section, so I jumped ahead. Yeah, yeah I'm sorry. That's OK. <laughs> We're going back it, to the north. We have details of the east and west. It, it's uh, You've already seen the west elevation, which is the one that was there with the uh, uh, Little John Street. Uh, the east elevation is uh, is obviously not highly visible. 
but it does show the wraparound of the uh, of the uh, brick band at the lower level. And uh, you can see, this is what I was saying. If you look at the, the upper drawing, which is the... Um, these, these, are the west, that's the north. West these are the two north elevations are. Do you want the east and west? No, this is all right. This is the north. Because I was going to say the, the, uh, the upper uh, is, is part of, in detail, the uh, Dorothy Road elevation. And uh, that's where I was mentioning we can uh, possibly bring that uh, right end of that, which is the one uh, uh, that abuts the west elevation down one level. I think that might be a good idea. This actually shows the entryway. Uh, it's just a blow up of what you've seen before. And uh, the, the uh, lower level is the, is the other end. So if you see at the right, this little high hatch mark, this, uh, the right end of that attaches to the left end of the upper drawing, and that's the that's what you saw in the long the long elevation. So now east west. <laughs> yep. So there we are. That kind of shows the the uh, path down to the garage. Uh, again, you're just seeing something you've already seen. That you can see how the right end of the uh, west elevation is off in the distance, therefore faded a little bit more to give a sense of of the setbacks. And uh, the, um, the east elevation has a wing coming out, as you can see, and then goes out and then uh, that uh, uh, brick colored band wraps the, uh, wraps the corner, which that's the corner you actually saw in that perspective. So now the section, sorry. No problem. So the section is through the courtyard and you can see the parking underneath. You can see this is cut on the courtyard that, uh, uh, has the floodplain storage coming in. So there's nothing, there's no parking on the uh, right. Uh, that's, that's actually floodplain storage. And uh, you can see the, uh, the, the, the left hand most uh, drawing. There is, is uh, actually a Dorothy Road. And then we have the sidewalk. Then we come up to our courtyard level uh, and then into the building. And the building is at elevation 13 the floor of the building itself. Uh, the floor of the uh, courtyard is 12.8, although that varies. Uh, elevation 12.8, the curb is elevation 10. So you can see 10 stepping up to 12.8, stepping up to uh, 13 inside the building. And there's seven foot eight clear in the garage, which means the, the floor of the garage is at about elevation 2.5. So I think that's uh, what we have to uh, put up for your review and questions and thoughts. Um, and uh, I think we thought, Scott, we'd go back to, uh, we, we can go anywhere anybody would like to, but we thought we'd go back to the, um, the uh, colored plan, that one, right, to begin the questioning and, and your thoughts. So thank you. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I have a, a bunch of questions. Um, I don't know if anybody else on the board would prefer to go first. Mr. Uh, Chairman, I have, I have a couple of questions. Mr. Ford. Um, given the flooding issues, have you guys considered um, permitting bowl pavements to aid in the stormwater management? I know that's related to the architectural. I know it's not directly architectural, but... Um, when I look at the civil plans and the architectural plans, it looks like it's just asphalt. Uh, I believe John is on the line, but we have been talking about porous pavement um, for the for all the uh, exterior uh, fire road and so on. That that would be porous, and in fact, the it, it's um, going to be a little complex because we'd like the, the it to be both porous pavement that the the uh, uh, fire trucks can drive on, but also a surface that is good enough for walkers, for people who are walking or, you know, have a carriage or a wheelchair even. So John is on the line uh, uh, somewhere. I saw him and maybe he has something specific uh, as the civil engineer that he'd like to add to that. Johnny there. Sure, Mr. Chairman, um, if I can, John Hessian from BSC. Just to supplement what, what Gwen had said, 
um, and to respond to Mr. Ford's question. Uh, the emergency vehicle access in the walking path around the perimeter of the building is proposed uh, to be um, porous pavement. Um, the primary surface parking lot is not proposed as porous pavement because it has the proposed um, stormwater infiltration system under the parking lot. So um, we really don't want porous pavement draining through that media and then into the infiltration system designed to um, accommodate the building and the, the surface parking. So, um, and with the predominance of the parking in the garage level, you know, surface pavements have really been limited on the site um, as much as possible. Okay. Um, th thanks. That that's helpful. One one more question, Mr. Chairman. Uh, um, what is setting the 176 units? And and I get, and let me preface this question by by saying, you know, one of my concerns is is the size of the building and how it encroaches into the into the floodplain on the backside, particularly where the the parking garage kind of goes in. So I think it would help all of us if we could maybe understand from the the designer's perspective, what, what kind of sets the units? So, uh, John, you might, we've worked really hard to uh, deal with the flood issues. And we, uh, you know, we, we want to pay attention to the town regulation, which I think is uh, more stringent than the state regulation, that there's a two for one <clears throat> uh, compensatory uh, storage being supplied in the project, or should be. And I think John can deal with that uh, and, and uh, bring that up. But uh, you can see the red lines here. The, the red lines are the flood areas. And you can see why we left that one courtyard uh, open for flooding. Uh, but there are some areas of flooding, which are the areas inside the line that's inside the yellow lines, that will be uh, where flooding uh, storage is impacted. And John, do you want to say anything about our our, uh, our strategy for uh, for compensating? For that? So, so sorry to jump in. I I I I uh, John has done it. Uh, Ms. Teshin has done a great job, and I understand how they're mitigating it. So I get, but but my question really is, uh, what it, what kind of sets the size of the number of units? So I I, I get how we're mitigating it. Is really just what's driving the 176 units from from the design side? Well, you know, obviously it's a goal that 25% of those units are affordable. We know that about the, uh, uh, about the whole 40B uh, system that we're working with here. I think it's, it's a, uh, we, we are not the owner of the site, uh, the Mugar family is, and there's a, uh, there's a threshold there uh, of the value of the land. And uh, as you know, they're, they're willing to, uh, uh, part of the land and, and give part of it to, to a nonprofit or whatever we might work out. Uh, but obviously they are, they are trying to, you know, compensate for the, for what they see as the value of the land, which is, is realistic. Um, and then, then you come to economics, you know, what does it cost to, to do a thing like this, uh, to provide the affordable housing, the 25%. And I think it's a, uh, you know, we started out with 219. And uh, I think interest rates are a little bit lower. We were able to move the, the uh, bar a little bit and take out some units. So we went from uh, 219 units to uh, uh, 176 units. So I can only say that that seems to work for all parties. These are compromises, uh, no question about it. And, and of course, we're compromising with uh, wetlands, with uh, flood storage, uh, as well as economics, uh, as well as uh, Dorothea, Dorothy Road and the impact of the building on Dorothy Road. So we're trying to balance that as best we can. And that's what this proposal is all about. That's all I have, Mr. Chairman. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Ford. Um, <clears throat> so I have a, a number of questions. Um, so I'd like to serve as a, a start question. How what, how are you planning to construct the, the foundation and the parking garage level? 
is this building bearing directly on the land? Is are you going with pilings? Are you is it a floating foundation house? Is well, that that I know it's not a <laughs> floating foundation. Uh, as to whether we need piles or not, uh, we have not done soils analysis at this point. Uh, I don't believe we do, but uh, that's that's an open question. If we do need piles, we would uh, obviously use them. Other than that, it would be a standard foundation. You'd have, uh, uh, you know, you're, you're already underground by five feet or so, six feet for the footings. Okay. Have you, um, for piles, would you be looking, have you considered doing drilled piles instead of, uh, there was a lot of work on route two that was pounding piles uh, for an extended period of time. Um, that was really disruptive to this area of Arlington, um, which is partly where this question comes from. Um, you know, would you be considering doing piles that are drilled as opposed to drilled and poured as opposed to pounded? We did a project that uh, was the same number of units above it. In other words, it was four four units over parking, four uh, stories over parking, and we did that as, as you're saying for that reason. We drilled them. And, uh, uh, you know, there really isn't much financial impact. I, I, I don't know if it's more expensive, less expensive, but I, I think the easy answer is yes. If at all possible, we would do that. You had mentioned that the, you're using a, a prefabricated module that's 62 by 13. Have you done a rough estimate of the number of units that would be re required for the project? Um, well, we know exactly how many units would be required. <laughs> Frankly, I haven't counted them, but we can. We can get that to you. It, it tends to be um, about 1.5 uh, boxes per unit. And the box is, of course, 62 feet long. So we could rough that out and say 176 times 1.5 is something like that, but I can get you the exact number because as you can see, those plans are completely drawn. They're 13 feet mm -hmm. wide, 62 feet long. And uh, the whole project is made of those boxes that are exactly that dimension. And uh, so I can get you an exact count of that. And those would be brought down Little John Street, is that correct? Uh, I, I would assume that, yes. Okay. And the you way that the way that through two before, so I just wanted to confirm. Um, they would just uh, be delivered on a daily basis, uh, maybe ten or twelve. And I just did a quick calculation for 176 units, would be something around 264. Um, so, um, say if it were ten a day, that'd be 20. 26 days, something like that. Okay. And I think we probably have also already said that, that uh, the, the box manufacturer, uh, we don't know where that would be right now, but <coughs> um, establishes a staging area. So boxes are uh, you know, put in the staging area so that you can feed a crane uh, rapidly. And as Gwen says, uh, 10 to 12 boxes a day is not, not uh, is fairly normal. Okay. <coughs> and, and have you reviewed the the roadways leading into the site to confirm the turning radiuses and the ability to turn the trucks around and get them out? That that seems to be okay. Okay. Um, the front courtyard um, that is not not the one that has the the parking spaces, but the other one. Um, there are no. There doesn't appear to be any entrances planned from the building onto that courtyard. That's correct. And it's it's a north facing courtyard with 33 and 44 foot walls on the east, west and north. So I'm curious how you envision this, what do you envision the space being in the winter or even in the, the spring and fall where it's never gonna see sunlight? Well, uh... Maybe I should have John speak to that. I, I assume that's a landscaping issue. Uh, obviously, people can get there and uh, you know come from the street side and into that and take care of it. But John, do you have anything that you could add to that? What would what might be planted there and that would work? It's north facing, as as 
Christiana is saying. Hi again, it's John. Uh, the, you know, that north east courtyard is envisioned to really be a passive recreation area and um, honestly probably you know uh, won't get much use during the winter given uh, what the, the, the chairman has uh, pointed out the north facing with the you know vertical walls but it will be um, landscaped with raised planters trees it will have it can be planted with some year-round interest um, you know that will provide visual uh, benefit to the you know to the people that live in those units that look out onto that space and and I really view it in the in the summertime as you know sometimes we're all searching for shade so uh, a nice place to you know go um, you know read a book and, and get out of the, the heat and the sun um, to be honest and it'll you know there'll be some uh, some seating provided um, but you know the point about the winter um, as, as many places in New England here, you know, there's the, the winter, although we're surviving with COVID much hardier than maybe we have in the past with uh, ent entertaining outdoors in the winter season. I was wondering if you had considered, you know, lowering the building around that to try to get more light into it, make it a little more three season rather than just sort of the, the single season it appears now. Well, to get sun in, it, it obviously, uh, I think, as you know, the the uh, south side of that, uh, you know, has four full stories. And I think that probably would not be very practical. As the sun uh, moves toward the west, then you're coming over the, uh, the three-story piece. And I suppose, particularly in the summer, you'd get sun in there, no question, uh, as, the, as the sun shifts around. But that's, uh, you know, again, it's, it's, uh, it's all a matter of balance. And uh, we're trying to make a project work here that's much more uh, pulled together, pulled out of the wetlands and the uh, and the floodplains. Uh, and of course, we reduced already a number of units, which uh, um, was was you know a challenge to to cut back the size of the project that far, an economic challenge. So uh, I know I'm not answering your question, but I'm, I'm <laughs> hoping that the sun comes over the uh, the wing, and that's that's the best I can do. Okay, um, where it's facing out directly onto Dorothy Road and the only access would be from that side, is it exclusive to the building or is it a public space that could be used by other residents of the neighborhood? Uh, John, do you have any thoughts about that? We haven't talked a lot about that. I'm sorry, um, was that public use of that Northeast Courtyard area? Yeah, is it, is it private or is it public just because the, the access is from the public way? Uh, I mean, that's something that is not, you know, um, definitive in, in the design. If, if that was something that would be, you know, an amenity to the, to the neighborhood um, mm -hmm. and to the project, I, you know, you, you're absolutely right. It has very easy access to, to the, sidewalk on Dorothy and would provide, um, you know, easy access for, for folks that live in the neighborhood. Um, I think something we might, we might think about, John, is uh, if we, um, you know, obviously there'll be, there'll be people uh, living around that courtyard. There'll, there'll be windows, uh, you know, maybe two feet uh, above, but not very far above the, the courtyard level. So um, they, they would need their privacy and, uh, and security. But maybe there'd be a way to have a public uh, piece carved out that wouldn't be so close to uh, windows. It's it's a very large courtyard. Uh, I think it's 91 feet across that. Uh, so there, you know, you could imagine a nice little park in the area there that could be public, and we'd certainly be open to considering that. Thank you. Um, how is trash going to be managed on site? I, I've talked with John about that. We have there are uh, trash rooms in the basement that are at the bottom of a, of the of trash chutes, and the trash truck would come back down the driveway to outside the building, and there would be 
uh, carts that take the containers out to the truck that would then do a, a, a rear loading. Mm -hmm. um, so, so the trap, the storage would be interior to the building until the time it's being removed. Yeah, and in sealed containers or closed containers. And that would the uh, recycling would be the same. Yeah. Um, uh, for the bicycle parking, um, it, it looks like you're accommodating all the, the bike spaces on the, um, where the bikes can stay on the floor, um, which the Arlington changed its zoning bylaws, which obviously because of the, the nature of this project, it doesn't impact you. Um, but the, the new bylaws that bike parking spaces, you can't require someone to have to lift a bike in order to store it. Yes, we we heard we heard that, and we've we we don't we don't think that's a, an issue. Okay, perfect. Um, did you say you're reducing you're reducing the number of cars parked in the in the sort of the center of that U shaped turnaround? Yeah, we're taking out two cars. That that's to give us a little more walking area and that sort of thing. place for bikes. Okay, it, so you can see it's tight. It, it was recommended by the that we might seriously consider uh, re lowering the number of cars we've got parked in the garage and on the site, which we're willing to do uh, to a certain extent. Um, uh, but we would need a waiver. Yeah. Um, and I, I know that it was brought up, I think, on tax comments to just the way that those parking spaces are oriented right now, um, you have to drive in on the left and drive out on the right, which is there is your yeah. I think the I think they're going to be need to be flipped. Yeah. Um, where where will the air handler units be located? They would all be on the uh, on the roof. Would they be on the the low roof, the high roof? Does it is it are you able to keep them farther from the street front? Well, uh, what we've been doing, and this, this may mean that they could all be on the upper roof, is using mini splits, Mitsubishi uh, mini splits, <clears throat> uh, which means what, what you have is a condenser uh, for each unit. And they would be on the upper roof, probably. And it's not, it, it, they don't need to be particularly near the units. The, the piping is, uh, is very small. And uh, that's easy enough. Now, the other issue is the ERVs, which uh, yeah. we will have. And uh, they, we believe the easiest thing with those is just to bring them right to the outside through the wall. Now, that may be <laughs> something you want to consider. I don't know, but it's uh, it's certainly the easiest thing to do is for each unit, <laughs> modular unit made in the factory, to have all that installed in the factory. Uh, you get higher quality, a lot higher quality, uh, and then you have two pipes going to the outside. They need to be ten feet apart. And, uh, you know, one is obviously intake and the other is outflow. And uh, I would think we've all seen buildings with various things like that. We probably would not have our washer dryers go to the outside. Uh, we've at least been doing, we're trying to make it an all electric building because that's really uh, the most sustainable thing to do. So um, we're looking into, and this some of the buildings we're working on in other sites uh, use all electric hot water heaters, one per unit. And there are tremendous uh, discounts available. They're expensive, but uh, because of the discounts, uh, they're not they're affordable. So that's those are the three key things: the ERVs, the hot water heater, domestic hot water, and then the heating and cooling, which is a mini split Mitsubishi. And uh, those can be fairly remote. We won't have to have any in that uh, lower roof. Uh, we could have them there, but I don't think we want to. I, mean, I think we want to have everything in the upper roof. And then how does that, how is that impacted by having the blue roofs? Uh, well, I, I, I'm not, I, I'm not sure exactly the definition of a blue roof. Well, uh, it's water. It's the water. That's the water. water okay. There. Well, I think uh, these can be lifted up. Yeah, you want to have your, your stormwater uh, uh, potential there. 
And, uh, you know, I can't answer that question easily. I, I assume what you do, you know, for example, PVs, they lift them up on, uh, you know, metal grids, mm -hmm. uh, keep it off the roof. Uh, I just assume these are, these are fairly light, these uh, condensers that uh, are part of the mini splits. So I think that would just be lifted up to allow the, the water to uh, pass underneath it. Okay. Have you done any lighting studies or um, investigated site lighting? That would be John, right? Uh, well, no, that's the, the site lighting. Uh, uh, we have not gotten that far. Um, I, I, we've been aware that it's like the next thing that we need to start addressing. And I think that that how the building uh, entry is lit and the signage and so on is all something that that um, is is of concern. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I did say in in my piece we, we use all LED lighting um, as just a matter of mm -hmm. course now. Um, now I was curious about so fifty eight um, Dorothy Road is the first house adjacent to the building um, to the east. And so that building now is going to have a 35 foot high wall next to it. Um, and then to the south, it's gonna be a more like a 40, 45 foot high wall. Um, so I wanted to ask if you have considered that, you know, the impact on the, that house in particular, but it's adjacent house as well as to how, um, you know, the introduction of this building is going to be impacting the usability of their uh, their rear yards where they're going to be losing, you know, a large percentage of their solar access. Scott, why don't you go to the uh, Dorothy Road elevation? Well, it no, wait, no, wait, no. Uh, as you can see, there's a, um, the building that's in the background is, is way behind the, uh, that, the house we're talking about, the brick house there in the corner. Uh, so you can see when the, when the three-story band comes out, uh, it's fairly far away from, uh, uh, from that, from that uh, building that looks like it's about, uh, I would say, almost 60 feet. Actually, let's see, it's 52 feet. One, two, three, four. Yeah, it's 52 feet between our building and the and the brick building. Scott, where's a plan that shows how the how the wing goes around behind the building? I think that would be relevant. We could go back to the um, the site plan. Yeah, that we're just looking at, I think, and just to kind of zoom in here. Right, that's good. So you can see. Uh, it's way, way back. You can see how far that, that wing that comes out is way back. Any shadows it would uh, impose would be way back. So what I was talking about, that's I think it's 52 feet. The reason I'm counting the uh, th number of 13s from the edge to there, uh, I think it's roughly yeah that distance. Can you, does your computer tell you what that is, Scott? No, I can't measure that in here, but... Um... Yeah, this is this is six as you said earlier. Art, this is sixty-two feet, uh, based on the modular box. Have you conducted any shadow studies? Uh, we have not, but we, yeah, we could and provide that. Okay, yeah, I think that would be that would be helpful to see. Um, you know, both in terms of the northeast courtyard and in terms of you know the impact um, on the the adjacent oh. neighbor. Okay. Um, then at the west, at the northwest end of the building, I believe it's no longer three stories at the street. Is that correct? You're stepping that corner back up again? Uh, that's correct. Is there a reason for doing that? Because you had talked about keeping the scale low along Dorothy Road, but you're stepping it up here. Uh, well, again, we... And, and this is, you know, we're, we're talking about negotiations here and, and what we can do and what we can't do. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we are, we're very much in a balancing act here, trying to create enough economic value to make this all work. And uh, so this was an issue of, uh, it seemed like a place where you could increase that, that a little bit. So we did. 
-hmm. but uh, uh, there are actually two reasons for that. Um, Scott, go to the, um, the fourth floor plan. Mm -hmm. So one reason was to just to capture a few more units, but the other is the stairway system. Uh, there may be another answer to that, but you can see there's a stair uh, in that right there. And we needed that stair to, uh, to be the end of that corridor. Now there may be other ways to solve that. Oh, I see what you're saying, okay. So uh, that, was, that was another reason that that was uh, pushed up was to get that stair in there. But I think these, you know, this is a negotiation and we're trying to make an economically viable project. Uh, so that's why we did that, the stair in the, uh, in the economics. Um, if you could jump back to the site plan. Mm -hmm. So the, where the, <clears throat> excuse me, where the access drive meets the corner of Dorothy and Little John. Is there a particular reason it's coming in at that angle and it's not aligned with Little John? That's a John Hessian question. Hi, John again, Mr. Chairman. Um, the, the design intent there was to um, create some definition so that it didn't appear to people traveling, you know, through the neighborhood that were unfamiliar, that that was an extension of Little John. Mm -hmm. um, so it was to, and and one of the comments from you know the town engineer was that they would like to see um, a driveway ap apron and concrete sidewalk across that uh, driveway entrance. That will help further, you know, kind of define it as a private entrance and not an extension of of Little John. Okay. Um, yeah, I was just sort of thinking in terms of, you know, every car that exits is going to be shining its lights diagonally across that into that house. Um, whereas if they're coming straight and they're aligned with little John, that won't be, that won't be an impact. So I was just curious as to where that was coming from. Yeah. I mean, it, it there, there's, you know, something else that also drove that um, <laughs> was there's an existing utility pole there that um, would, in order to straighten that out and have it align with Little John uh, would require the relocation of um, that one utility pole. The, the issue of a sense of entry, I mean, we could, we could do gate posts or something like that if that's an, a, another way of indicating mm -hmm. the end of Little John, but mm -hmm. that, that, that doesn't solve the utility pole problem, but. There, there are ways, other ways to give the message that little John isn't continuing into our drive. And I, I do appreciate your willingness to talk about the, the number of parking spaces. I know this is um, it's sort of a large issue. I don't want to you know, speak out of turn for my, for my board, but I, I do think that there's a lot of interest in trying to reduce the amount of parking that would be involved, especially the the large parking lot to the west um, because of the impacts it has on the on the neighbor but also it's just sort of, you know it's, it's quite a quite distant to a lot of the building um, yeah. but Wait. the concern we have or at least the concern I personally have is uh, about guest parking um, because you know as you know the neighborhood you know, Arlington does not allow overnight parking and um, these are not large streets. And so with a large, if, you know, if this building was to proceed at the size it is, um, you know, is there a way to manage the amount of guest parking to, you know, allow the, the building to function, the people to have their guests, but also to not overwhelm the neighborhood? Um. We, we've had a considerable number of discussions about this, mm -hmm. um, and uh, we we, uh, we we if we go below the number we have, as you know, we would need a waiver. Yeah. Um, uh, we have discussed how we would use a waiver and and um, uh, tr still balance what you're saying. 
and and certainly the uh, the occupant need. So uh, I can say that uh, the two obvious places that we would that we would immediately make a, a change and reduce the parking are right near the Little John neighbor. And uh, I mentioned in my in my presentation that we would be uh, very willing to cut down the size of that parking lot. <clears throat> and also make the entry courtyard a little safer and more comfortable for parking. Those are two places that would be obvious to um, uh, give up a few spaces of parking for the amenity level. But the, the other question of how many spaces do we really need is something that, that um, is a balancing between the market and the needs of the community. And the desire of not, you know, of not having people trying to park on the street. In your so experience on. with with recent projects, what has worked as a ratio? Is it um, one, one car per unit? Is it? it usually, there, uh, it's it kind of depends upon uh, who the what the composition of tenants are. I mean, mm -hmm. we're finding that millennials who are commuting into town um, a lot and using Ubers or renting cars when they need them. Um, they're, they're using, you know, using public transportation that, 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 that a lot of them are getting along without, uh, without a car or certainly if, if it's two of them, they're, they're doing well with one. So it's, but if you, if you get farther away, um, <laughs> it's, people do need their cars. Um, we, we've, you know, we've been doing some studies in the neighborhood and, and Scott Thornton is not here to, to speak for this, but um, uh, a, a number that seems to work both from a market standpoint and, um, uh, and you know, in a functional way is 1.2 spaces per, per unit just as an average. Yeah, because I mean, I, I know you're, you're well aware that the, the two largest issues um, and the, the issues that are, are really, you know, weighing heavily upon this board and upon the neighborhood is this question of how to deal with the traffic, what the traffic impact will truly be. Right. And so, and the impact on the wetlands and especially changes in the flood pattern in the neighborhood due to the construction and, and both of those are, um, you know, the, the, the larger the building, the, the more the, that becomes a, a concern for, for people. And so, um, you know, it's good to know that, I, I think, you know, that if we move to limit the parking, it will, you know, something like that would be amenable to the, would be something that, you know, might be a, a better way to sort of put a cap on what the traffic is but as I've been reading through a lot of the comments that are posted uh, by members of the community, those appear on the, on the agenda as an attachment. Um, and there's a, a lot of people are concerned that there will be a lot more vehicle trips um, from this project, partly because of the, you know, with the, in the post COVID era, people will be more likely to not rely on public transportation until their fears have settled down. And so there may be more use of vehicles. Um, it is still, this building is still a considerable distance from Mass Ave. It's three quarters of a mile from the entrance to Alewife. So, you know, people who are less mobile will still want to drive. Um, and so, you know, that there's definitely a need for parking here, um, but, as you say, it's sort of a, it's a balancing act that we need to try to find some resolution to. Well, we, we assured Scott that Scott Thornton, our traffic engineer, who's done a lot of research into the parking, that that uh, this was not a parking or traffic <laughs> hearing, so yep. um, that, it, that he didn't need to be here. But um, I think just anecdotally, um, there's a lot of sort of hand wringing about what's going to be the effect, the long term effect of COVID, because many people are working at home and not commuting. And how many of those will, people will be going back to commute? That's that's one question that's out there. And then if people who are 
are worried about this went back to the notes from the traffic advisory committee and the findings that were there. There's a lot to be said about, about how, what the process for looking at the traffic uh, problems that, that might or might not come from this project. So uh, there's a lot, of, a lot of intelligence in your files about the traffic question. And, and as I said earlier, um, we're, we're, if, if Scott were here, if we were prepared to be talking about traffic, he would have been here, but he's not. No, no, absolutely. Um, other questions from the board? Mr. Revelak. Yes. Thank you for noticing, Mr. Chair. <laughs> uh, I do, <laughs> you, you, you actually covered quite a few of the things I was going to ask. So, um, you know, I, I thank you for doing that, but there, there are a couple of others. Um, so with respect to modulars, uh, do you have a manufacturer picked out or is there, has a manufacturer been selected? Well, we, um, we work with two or three different manufacturers and uh, kind of go back and forth. Uh, one is in Canada. And uh, as you may know, he completed a year, a year or two ago, I think it's about a year and a half ago, a big project in Newton. Uh, that was 68 units, as I remember. And that was made in Canada, uh, RCM. And that's one that we work with. Uh, KBS is a company in Maine that we're actually engaged in a project right now with and talking to them about a number of other projects. And I would say that that would be probably the one we would assume that would be the uh, uh, who might make these. It's in a, a place called, um, it's the name of the town, Oxford. South, South Paris, South or Ox Oxford, Maine. Uh, they're very good and very reliable. And then there are several in Pennsylvania that we also talk to. There's a Simplex, uh, which is big. There's a BBC, which is, uh, has a factory in, uh, I think, just south of Philadelphia that we're also talking to. So I don't know. Easy answer is we, we would not designate at this time. Uh, mm -hmm. It really is an issue that the, the CM, the, the uh, contractor to build the building, uh, is the one who actually signs a contract with the modular manufacturer. So what we do is, is uh, you know, get the drawings done, the CD drawings done, uh, bring in the C, the C, we call them CM, construction managers, mm -hmm. uh, general contractor, whichever you want to call them, and uh, then work with them to identify the modular manufacturer because they have to live with that performance of that modular manufacturer. So you want them there with you when you try to figure out who to, who to sign. They own it. Okay, thank you. Um, my next question, I was wondering, uh, what will the laundry facilities look like? We would have laundry in every unit. Okay. Washer and a dryer, every unit. Okay, very good. Uh, uh, another thing I was curious about is, you know, hypothetically, let's say I were a tenant and I ride in on my cargo bike with a load of groceries, uh, what would be my path from um, your, the bicycle parking area to, uh, you know, to an apartment. I can answer that. Sure, go ahead. Um, if you rode your bike uh, mm -hmm. back uh, and wanted to go park your bike in, a, in its own specific place, if it were in the basement, there, you'd have an entrance uh, on the east end of the building. You'd have a, a, a probably a fob entrance into into the parking the bicycle parking area in the in the garage which is right opposite the 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 uh, elevators are very very close to where the elevators are um the, the scott can indicate where the the parking is and where the elevators are mm -hmm. and that would take you straight up to the, your floor with your groceries and um in another building that we've been involved with we actually have um, grocery carts that that live in the basement, but people can use them to, to uh, take their groceries up and then bring them back down. And then if you were lucky, you'd be parking upstairs in that uh, there's bikes right next to the entryway. And of course, the same thing can happen there. You park your bike, come over, uh, enter the building through the front door and go to the elevators. That's it. 
Okay, and I do understand. So, um, actually, th this uh, leads to a follow-up question: uh, bicycle and automotive automobile parking uh, spaces are will they be numbered and assigned to individual tenants with you know like some number for guests, or um, just curious how that would be managed? Um, you know, I think that that's a, a moving target. It, it depends upon how many bikes. Um, uh, it, it would be very doable to um, assign them and have everybody provide their own lock. Um, uh, we found in the past that, that, that it turns out that a number of bicycles got, get abandoned. So eventually you have to cut the locks and, and mm -hmm. uh, give the bikes away or something like that. But um, uh, in the management of the building will have a system that they, that they, that they like and are familiar with. And um, uh, there are a number of good managers that we've worked with there. They tend to be very professional about s solving problems like that. Okay. And uh, in the event that a, you know, a tenant uh, preferred to store their bike uh, in their unit, would they have the option of doing so? Well, that's a good question. Uh, <laughs> some people get these very expensive bikes and they love to do that. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's it's not, it's not to be likes. encouraged. Yeah, it, it really and... yeah, choose up the elevators. It's it's um, I mean, I think the preferable way to do it is to is to provide a good enough, secure enough, safe enough, uh, or you know, pleasant enough um, bicycle room on the ground floor. I, you know, I've seen some buildings. We haven't gone there yet where they actually have you know bicycle repair areas that you can you know borrow tools or put a, bicycles up on a stand um I, you know we we haven't thought through that <laughs> uh, or checked out where it would go but i think you know as you're picking up uh, well my husband and i are bicyclists <laughs> uh, we like it we're for it we want to encourage the bicycle culture in the building and uh, we'll do whatever we can uh, that that is uh, practical to uh, make the, the use and and coming and going and so on of bicycles be a, be a good experience. Okay, and uh, I, I do think the uh, idea of providing a repair space, um, you know, I you know, a stand and tools would be wonderful, but um, even just space for someone to bring down their own tools and own stand uh, would be useful because I mean, bicycles need periodic maintenance. Um, and having a space to do that is, you know, an important part of, um, you know, riding and owning. Yeah, I, I like that idea a lot. You know, one thing, just uh, sort of a mea culpa or an apology, we didn't know a lot about this uh, idea of the bike stands uh, not not allowing any kind of lifting. In this particular bike stand, I liked. You, but you do have to lift the front end about a foot off the ground. And it's an idea, you know, you can put more bikes in less footage because the handlebars don't uh, don't get, we've all, any, any biker knows how irritating that is. So anyhow, we do have to, if anybody looks at this carefully, these bikes are slightly closer together than, uh, than will need be, uh, than will be actually uh, true. So we have, we have plenty of other spaces to put bikes. So it's not, we'll keep the numbers up because uh, we believe in this stuff. But uh, just looking at this, those bikes are a little bit tighter than uh, if you have no lift. And I think the current wisdom mm -hmm. now that we just in the last couple of days came to us that even one foot off the ground is probably not <laughs> going to pass the, uh, the official uh, mm -hmm. designation of no lifting. But there, you know, to get to, I, I'm, I'm delighted to hear this closer interest in bicycles. Um, yeah, uh, if great. If uh, if we do end up being requested and allowed uh, to reduce the number of cars, that definitely is a plus for the bicycle uh, population or storage or, or or workspace kind of option. That that could that would help. Okay. So I just have uh, two or three more questions. Uh, one uh, going back to the front entrance way. Um, I recall there being sort of a little bit of an overhang and uh, with, you know, cable supports to just visually accentuate it. But on the rendering, I, it still took me a couple of seconds to, you know, to find it. Um, you might consider uh, adding some trim around the door 
uh, or just something to accentuate the door itself, you know, in addition to the overhang. Um, that's just a suggestion. And finally, um, a couple of the earlier, part of the earlier discussion is focused on uh, building height and, you know, to throw something else into the uh, compromise and trade-off category where um, I was wondering if there had been any thought given to um, just basically shifting the entire structure vertically at all. So, I mean, it, so it would be, you know, the foundation not as deep, building would be a little bit higher, but it would be further away from uh, any risk of flooding and presumably, I'm thinking perhaps also less obstruction to existing um, groundwater flows. So you're seeing the same footprint, but lifting it up, am I right in that? That is exactly right. Okay. Well, uh, you know, I, I think uh, as designers of this kind of building, uh, one always tries to keep it as low as you possibly can. So that's just a, uh, a natural instinct, but it's, it's quite easy. And actually, as you probably know, would save money raising the thing up as well as uh, being uh, less susceptible to any damage from, uh, from flooding. So we'd be happy to consider that, but I'm not sure there'd be a general consensus on that being a good idea, but it's, it's quite doable. All right, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Chair, I have no further questions. Thank you, Mr. Avalak. Mr. Mills. Yes, uh, uh, Chair, can we request they put the landscape uh, drawing back up, please? Absolutely. Scott, <laughs> go for it. I have a few issues I'd like to make points on here. You know, obviously the neighbors feel this is a rather large and imposing structure in the middle of their neighborhood. And I don't think we're going to be able to do too much about that. But I am very concerned about this uh, northern corner, which was originally three stories, which is now going to be four. Uh, and I think it's already visually imposing enough on the neighbors without adding that. And I think you should try and find another place to put the stairway. I'm not looking for a comment back, just something for you to consider. Now, I do have a question. In regards to the whole building, has anybody calculated out the displacement of the excavation? Is that a known figure, please? Uh, John, do you have an idea about that? Or I, We haven't calculated. We haven't brought in the geotech people. OK, thank you. Um, I didn't carefully get a chance to review the side uh, elevations. How far down will this building go below grade? Well, most of the grades around there, I think, are eight or nine feet. Elevation eight or nine. Um, it's on one of the drawings. And, uh, you know, our, our basement floor is at about elevation two and a half. So you can see, you know, you're coming from eight round numbers down to two round numbers. So the, the it would be around six feet below, of course, the, the grade is up and down, up and down a little bit. It's not hilly, but I would guess it would average maybe six feet, five to six feet that would, would have to be removed. So essentially, you've created a subterranean, a large dam that will uh, interfere with water migration from the existing houses. I guess it would be on the other side of Dorothy Street and up Little John. I do believe the groundwater there would be tend to migrating towards the Elway Brook. This all used to be an extensive, if you will, wetlands continuous from uh, Fresh Pond and Spy Pond over to the Elway Brook. And the natural drainage patterns would be towards the brook. So essentially, um, you've created a dam there. Now, the people in this neighborhood already have extensive problems with uh, water migration into their homes. Their sump pumps pretty much run just about all the time is what I've been advised. Um, what can you say to these people that would address this problem? You're gonna be displacing a lot of soil that would have been absorbing water. You're basically building a dam that's gonna be preventing the water from migration. 
And I do believe you're going to be causing quite a problem for the surrounding neighborhoods. Uh, and lastly, I do have a concern about the water on the roof. Where is that eventually going to go? So if we could answer those issues, I'd be quite happy. John, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Um, <laughs> so uh, there, there was a lot there. I, um, I think I jotted um, those down accurately. I'll do my best. Um, so with respect to your question or comment of the dam, uh, creating a dam for groundwater, um, our groundwater um, monitoring results show that the groundwater here in the vicinity of the building um, is between elevation you know, zero and elevation three. So we used elevation three for our um, stormwater design. Art mentioned that the garage floor is at about elevation two and a half. I believe it's actually at elevation 2.83. So the building is really not, the building garage and, and, and basement level is really not in the groundwater. It's basically sitting right on top of the groundwater. And I think it was um, Mr. Revlak, you know, raised the question about potentially raising the building a little bit and if there's anything we could do there. So the building itself, the garage, you know, from a groundwater perspective, really will not be creating a dam for the flow of, of groundwater. Um, the second question of where the, you know, the rooftop detention goes, it's routed through roof drains that go, that are plumbed through the building, out through the ceiling of the uh, garage, um, and to the west into the stormwater drainage system, ultimately into the infiltrates, you know, underground infiltration system that's under that surface parking lot. So you're going to be dumping copious amounts of water underneath the parking lot next to a resident home on uh, Little John Street. Is that correct? Um, not immediately next to it, um, but also, as, as you mentioned, you believe that the groundwater, the normal groundwater flow direction is towards Alewife Brook and not back towards the the neighbor on, on Little John. Well, that may be, but if you start adding, I'm gonna say it looks like a few hundred, few thousand square feet of water drainage into a concentrated area, I'm gonna think it's gonna be bringing up the local water table pretty good. You know, you do have a migration going towards, but you're still gonna be pumping a lot of water into a relatively small area. And I do believe those local homes may be impacted. Just a thought. Anything further, Mr. Mills? I'm all set, thank you. Thank you. Other members of the board? Mr. DuPont says no, Mr. Hanlon? Mr. Hanlon says no, Mr. O'Rourke? I think for Mr. O'Rourke. Okay. Um, so one one last question I have um, is sort of the disaster scenario question. Um, so when this area floods, which is not a question of if, but it's a when, um, how do you keep water out of the basement, out of the parking garage on short notice? And if the base, if the garage floods, how do you get the water back out without impacting the neighborhood? Uh, John? So um, I'll, I'll take a stab at answering that question. So you, you mentioned the disaster scenario, but when you said this area, when it floods, are, are we talking 2070 flooding or are we talking FEMA 100 year flood at elevation 6.8? Uh, we're talking 10 years ago when Dorothy Road was flowing. 
so the um, well at at elevation six point eight the 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 flood waters won't rise up to and we don't have a grading plan um, the flood waters would have to rise up to approximately elevation nine to be able to spill over um, down the um, the ramp to the garage. Um, so we believe that based on the current, you know, FEMA flood information, uh, the site is graded to uh, minimize or, or eliminate the potential for flooding in the garage. For any water that does get into the garage, the garage will be um, fitted with uh, oil, oil gas separators and, and a pump system to uh, pump any um, flow from the garage out. And at that point, it's pumping from within a building. So it would be pumped to the sanitary <laughs> sewer system and not a, not a external uh, stormwater system. Okay. Cause, yeah, because typically, because one of the issues that we, that occurs in this neighborhood is that the, the stormwater system in the streets gets completely sad, gets completely filled. Um, uh, Mr. So you're not going to be able to pump into it. Right. So Mr. Chair? Yes, please. Um, may I ju just to give a little context? Um, and I'm speaking from the perspective of someone who lives adjacent to Alewife Brook. Um, it's you know on, on the other side of East Arlington, but it's still in the same floodplain. I mean, uh, with respect to like flooding disasters and water, I I would I personally see three basic categories of risk. One is you know just rainfall events that become slightly heavier and produce more say basement infiltration. You know you get a wet basement. Uh, this is something that's going to um, you know, continue to happen. It's a nuisance, um, but you know, it, it involves a little bit of pumping, you, you know, you run your shop back, et cetera. The next grade up is, you know, the, you know, what are contemporary hundred year flood events, um, which, you know, in my case, put about two feet of water in the basement, um, which, you know, involves pumping, involves um, tearing down and cleaning up and, and, you know, various other forms of remediation. Um, and then finally, there is the, uh, the, the more catastrophic event that we haven't actually seen yet, but are likely to in the future, which is a flanking or overtopping of the Amelia Earhart Dam where seawater comes back, uh, you know, following the Mystic River or Alewife Brook. Um, one of the reasons I keep fussing about, you know, building height is I would really, really like to see, um, you know, really like to see the building tall enough or elevated enough that it's going to withstand that, meaning that it, it will be above a, a sea level rise storm surge event in 2070. Uh, beyond that, um, yeah, it's, there's going, you're going to have to, um, you're gonna have to, you're go, you will need to pump out a basement if it floods. Um, now, finally, uh, I just, you know, I, I, I think it is worth, saying, and this kind of goes back to what Mr. Mills uh, mentioned earlier, storm events are going to get worse and more frequent over time. So, I mean, to the extent that problems exist, they are going to get worse, whether this building is built or not. Um, I, I think we have, what I would hope we can do is ensure that, um, you know, the construction of this building does not accelerate the, the ter deterioration of conditions in these neighborhoods. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so with that and no other questions from the board, I think we are ready to move on to public comment. Um, so just a couple of quick notes before I open the floor. Um, so public questions and comments will only be taken as they relate to the matters at hand and should be directed to the board for the purpose of informing our decision. Uh, due to previously demonstrated interest in the project and to provide for an orderly flow to the meeting, the chair strongly encourages individual public speakers to limit their comments and use their time to provide comment related to the topic discussed. Please note that there are multiple hearings scheduled for this project, although we are getting very close to the end. 
Um, the chair also encourages the public to provide written comment to be reviewed by the board and included in the record. Uh, the procedure for requesting to speak will be the same as for previous hearings. Please select the raise hand button from the participant tab on Zoom or dial star nine on your phone to indicate you'd like to speak. When called upon, please identify yourself by name and address. You'll be given time for your questions and comments. All questions will be addressed through the chair. Please remember to speak clearly and in a way that helps us to generate an accurate record of the meeting. Once all public questions and comments have been addressed, um, the public comment period for this evening's hearing will be closed. As previously noted, there are multiple hearings scheduled. Uh, board and staff will do our best to, have, to show documents being discussed. If you'd like a specific document to be pulled up during your comment, please ask us to do so. Um, so with that, I will go ahead um, and find the list. Okay, um, uh, Mr. McCabe, go ahead and unmute yourself. Mark McCabe? Yes, I'm here. All right, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I, there's just a couple of questions. Uh, Mark, if you could just give your uh, address. Oh, that's right. I'm sorry. Mark McCabe, for Dorothy Road. Thank you. Uh, Arlington, Mass. Uh, I, a couple of questions. One, the first is that has all the people who are representing the development tonight have always used words like could, would, might, but there's no definite words being used in the development that's proposed to the community itself. And I was just wondering why they can't answer these questions directly as to opposed to using could, would, and might. Um, I'll sort of I, I give a little insight into that. Um, so part of the 40B process, the way it is organized by the state um, is that boards are to review what are essentially preliminary designs and preliminary drawings um, for the project. And then we grant uh, waivers and issue conditions to essentially create a, the, the boundaries for what the, the project can be. Um, and then with that, the, the developer can then proceed towards developing a final set of drawings. Um, and I think that's part of the reason for the, uh, you know, sort of for the cautionary language is that really until, uh, both until the board reaches a decision um, and until they reach a final design, there are aspects of this project that uh, due to the nature of 40B, we cannot uh, know definitively. Um, just ask uh, uh, our council real quick um, if that's accurate. Mr. Okay. Yes, Mr. The Chairman, second question is, is inaccurate. Is, is there any way that I know there's a, a new proposed structure, but what stops the developers from going on to in adding on to those new structures? Is there anything? In, in legal ways or anything else, I, they've dropped it down to 170 some odd. Uh, what's to stop them from going on after they develop the 170 uh, units? Thank you, Mr. Haverty. Can you respond to that question? Absolutely, Mr. Chairman. Um, technically speaking, nothing would prevent an applicant for coming back in and seeking a modification of the board's approval to add units to the development. However, the board would not be required to approve the modification unless the applicant is able to show that the development as currently constituted um, was uneconomic. Um, there has been one case out of the Housing Appeals Committee in which an applicant um, sought a rather mo minor modification to a previously approved development that had been constructed and had been operated over a number of years and the Housing Appeals Committee said, you know, this has been operating successfully for many years. Um, therefore, it's not an uneconomic project and therefore the board is not required to grant this modification. Um, so it would be unlikely that there would be a circumstance where the applicant will be able to successfully come and add units 
over the, the objection of the board. Thank you, because I thought it'd be unlikely you could develop on wetlands and uh, floodplains, but apparently they can. Uh, I appreciate all your work and all your help, and uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. McCabe. Um, next up, uh, Jennifer Griffith. Okay. Thanks. Um, and thanks, uh, Chairman, for uh, reading my letter and asking a lot of my questions. <laughs> um, so uh, I appreciate that very much. But I do really want to emphasize uh, that this whole project is just beyond the scope and scale of this neighborhood. It's great um, talking about it. You know, as commenting in the chat that. Uh, huh? Yeah, uh, like they have, everyone has it on like this. I don't know what the fuck it is. Mark, Mark, we can hear you. Oh, there we go. Yeah. So, uh, basically, you know, this is like adding a piece of the city into, uh, you know, a residential neighborhood. So it's beyond, beyond reasonable. Um, the amount of traffic that it will add. Uh, we're not talking about traffic today, but also um, I am very concerned about the construction and a construction technique. And I urge the Zoning Board of Appeals to make sure that it's conditioned that any sort of foundation construction is not driving piles when they drove piles across Route 2. You know, and I'm pretty far, I'm across Thorndike Field and everything, and still my house shook. Um, so if we have pile driving right in this neighborhood, that's just a disaster. And um, there needs to be conditions that the developer will survey all of our homes and our basements for the baseline conditions so that we have a basis for uh, compensation because the foundation issues are just, I mean, the pile driving, just take that off the table. Um, and the other thing I just, a hearing tonight with these modular units, I really think you should go and just double check that you can turn from Lake Street on to Little John because... It, that just doesn't seem like it will really work. Um, and maybe this whole thing, you know, isn't going to work because <laughs> you physically can't get your units here. So, um, and the last thing I'll say is that the, when it rains a lot, all of the whole region, the groundwater flows down into this floodplain that we, that's in this neighborhood, and the groundwater level comes up substantially. So, if you're adding the stormwater flow, just what you think is going to be some dry underground place, it's not going to be dry. You're going to be flooding the neighborhood, and the water will your ba your basement and the garage is going to be in contact with groundwater when there's a significant rainfall because the groundwater level just comes up in this neighborhood. And people on Dorothy Road maybe can comment about their experience, but um, it's, I end up with a pond in my backyard. I might be a few feet lower than where you are, but I end up with ducks swimming <laughs> in the spring in the corner of my backyard, so. Thank you. Um, scroll, there we go. Um, uh, Anna Driscoll. Yeah, hello. My name is Anna O'Driscoll. I live at 23 Little John Street. Um, I have three uh, sets of questions. One is about the impact to the neighborhood during building. It sounded like the modulars were going to be driven around the streets around here. I'd like to know what the plan is for that. Secondly, my question relates to rats. Um, there's a huge problem with rats in this neighborhood. What studies have you done? What are the plans? Third question relates to children. There are many children who live in this neighborhood who play on these streets. Um, what studies have been done? What provisions will be put in place for their safety during construction? Um, if I could turn to, to Gwen for that. Um, the, the, so the three questions, one about the construction impact, sort of how, how are the boxes gonna be moving into the neighborhood? Um, yep. How they'll be scheduled. 
Uh, second is a question about uh, rats and other uh, rodents in the in the vicinity, and then also the safety of the of uh, children and the residents of the neighborhood during construction. Correct. Yeah. Uh, um, I'll, I'll I'll answer the 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 rats and um, uh, the, the, make a stab at the children's safety. That every construction project starts before construction with um, the rat management uh, program because there's a there's an assumption that that it just needs it. So there's a an extensive um, uh, rodent. Uh, removal process that goes on before construction starts. Um, uh, the children's safety is is a good question, and um, uh, the the extent to which a police detail is needed for um, the any of the construction activity, uh, we will we will uh, you know see that that's part of the construction. Uh, Contract uh, and other than that, I think there there, there may be uh, other other uh, ways of handling that that is advised to us and will be open to to uh, any discussions about that either with the neighbors or or with the building department. And Art's going to talk about the modules. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure. Could you repeat the module question? Was it the, the how do I don't Yeah, get so, the so I'd like to understand more about, um, you know, when you are, or how you're intending to get your building materials essentially into the construction site. And so you, it sounds like there'll be a lot of trucks and, you know, do you have to access your site, obviously. Um, and so given that there's really only one street that I've the best of times can handle one and a half cars going either from, you know, I'm, I'm presuming you have been at, at Little John Street and Dorothy Street personally, and you've seen it. So there's not even two cars can go down there. So I'm just curious, you know, what your plan would be to bring things into the site. Right. As I mentioned earlier, the uh, it, it's up to the modular manufacturer to have actually a staging area. We don't know where that would be yet, but they have uh, they feed the uh, building the crane. There's a crane obviously uh, involved on the site, so the uh, the, the flow of uh, boxes from the staging areas is very controlled uh, with telephones and all that kind of good stuff. And uh, if Newton is an example, and I really think it is, that we had continuous uh, police. Uh, uh, attendance there, uh, watching the flow of pedestrians, all that kind of stuff. And these things are required by the building department. So it's not something that, uh, it's something that you can depend on because uh, the, the permit is dependent on it. I think the, um, you know, in terms of uh, impact, and actually we want a competition to do that, uh, that project in Newton. And the reason we won the competition is because we said we would do modules, which of course we did. And uh, part of that was the speed. In other words, we completed the building faster and the impact of shipping the modules was a lot less than a, uh, a conventional uh, construction method where uh, the trucks, <laughs> uh, you know, you have a truck of sheetrock and then boards and then roofing and then nails. And, you know, it's, it's a continuous flow of trucks where this is uh, obviously intense when you're putting the modules. I think Glenn did a quick take there and we can do a little more research on that and get some numbers out there but this is intense but quick and uh and you're, tidy you're you're bringing everything there in these boxes you know all the toilets are in all the flooring is in all the uh, everything is in there and shipped and put up so i think from the standpoint of um you know we have looked at the uh, the access it seems to be okay uh and I, I hear what you're saying about the width of the street. The street is not wide, but uh, the, the modules are delivered in a very uh, sequence manner, uh, done with phones and, and police details and all that sort of thing to make sure that uh, that the, the negative impact is, is minimized, not to say there isn't some, but it's minimized. And I just want to underline something that Arthur said, that um, the length of time that there is heavy traffic going in and out will be much reduced because of the, the oh, and, and another, oh. there's another um, uh, point about modular construction and that is there's 
infinitely less site waste. The, the uh, amount of debris that is generated in the construction process is greatly reduced, which actually has uh, an environmental impact because um, when the factory is doing the construction and, and, and all the, the gathering of materials and, and management, they are very efficient in the factory. They reuse small pieces, and and it's it's. it's but anyway, well, I just think it's something that people don't know that about modular construction. That it, from an environmental standpoint, it's it's um, it's very efficient. Thank you. Anything further, Mr. Driscoll? Yeah, I just want to make sure that the zone uh, zoning board really is considering children's safety, not during the construction. Um, but once the um, the property is there, if it is to be built, I think there's there's some serious considerations there that clearly have not been looked into. Also, rat management. It's not just it's not just uh, re removing them before construction. What happens afterwards? We have a rat issue in the area, um, and also I just want people to note that um, that the developers have said that the uh, that it will be intense and continuous flow of trucks down the streets. Thank you very much. Um, Patricia Brown. Hi, can you hear me? I can. If you could just repeat your name and give me your address, please. Uh, Patricia Brown, 49 Mary Street. Um, I've got a couple of things. Um, I, um, Gwen mentioned rat management. Does that mean poison? Ms. Noise? Uh, actually, I, I, I can't say. I don't, I, I, it, I don't know. There's a lot of I can't say in this tonight. <laughs> well, There's an I, awful I, lot of that. It's been a while since I've had to do this, and I... And I well, and, welcome to the neighborhood. Um, uh, I, I don't know what the um, most recent developments are in environmental disposal of rats uh, but I there, there probably is something that that uh, uh, manages to dry out their 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 thirst or something I no, don't know we'll look into it we'll, we'll look into we'll just, it we'll just send them off to New Hampshire they can look they can be run, run free in the woods up there um, your, landscaping shows, your landscaping shows there are nine trees that look on the plans to be about 40 or 50 feet tall how big are the trees you're actually going to plant? This is John is here. Well, I, I, you know that's that's, not, that's a good that's a good question too. Um, uh, I, we the the trees are more symbolic in the plans right now. Um, we we like to plant trees, and um, that's something that that uh, the, the size and species exactly has not been detailed, but uh, if... Okay, so you could plant saplings and that would still meet the letter of the, the development? Uh, we no. have, no, no, I mean, we haven't, we're, we're not going to put saplings in, but at the same time, I, I can't say that we're gonna put in, you know, 10 inch diameter, fully grown trees. Well, that's what you're showing in the plans, just, you know. Well, they do grow. <laughs> Uh -huh. Just, just yeah, to step in briefly, um, Ms. Brown, if you could address your questions to the board rather than to the applicant, and then I sure. can. Sure. Okay. Um, well, it's supposed to be a two. Construction. Is there any way that right now we're we're facing a forty foot wall of construction on our that we're going to be facing? Is there any way to step it back so that we have a one floor or a two floor, and then step it back further so it feels more like it's in keeping with the neighborhood it's this just feels like we <coughs> dropped something from mass app in the middle of our neighborhood um that, that's certainly something we can discuss with the uh, with the applicant um okay and the last question is you keep talking about where the modular staging is going to be and that will be determined i'm kind of looking like where Anywhere around here could that possibly be staged? It, that that uh, that that flummoxes me in terms of that and how you're possibly going to be able to bring these modules down our street. I mean, the, the turn from Lake Street onto onto Little John. I can't imagine a 75 foot vehicle is going to be able to make that turn. Mr. Clipple, are they state that when you talk about a staging area, is that something that's on site or is that something that's off site? 
No, it can be two miles away, five miles away or whatever. Uh, it's uh, pretty easily managed today with the phones. And uh, when I said the, uh, you know, the, it, it's intense because they, they make sure that the second uh, or the minute that the box is taken off a truck, that that truck is out and a new truck is pulling in. So, uh, you, you know, you keep that flow using a phone and it could be, you know, they'll have a number of pilot cars, trucks, uh, you know, getting those boxes delivered. And obviously you need more pilot cars if you have a longer distance. So it could be 10 miles away. It could be, uh, and it could be things like a, uh, it's been a churchyard. It's been, uh, you know, various industrial area where there's an open space or whatever. You need space for about uh, 20 boxes, something like that to keep things staged. And uh, it's, it's never been a problem. We've done a number of these projects. I did want to just add one thing about the rat control that, uh, in, in our experience, anyhow, most, most uh, cities or towns have, have a, uh, regulations on the fact that you need to do that as a developer. It's not a choice. You don't, uh, it, it sets what that criteria is. And I think, uh, so what, there are companies that do that. So <laughs> when you have to do this, you call a company and you say, you know, we, we need you. And so they come and do it. I think what's happening now, I just noticed that various things that people are trying to uh, organize a humane way uh, to do this, and I, I don't know what that means because uh, we haven't looked into that. But uh, we, we have another house that had a lot of bats, and there was a way to try to get those bats out where they they weren't killed. Uh, you know, it's a it's a more humane. I don't know what you do to be humane to a rat. So I leave that up to the professionals. All right, my last question. Yes, Ms. Brown. Is, is the what is from from day one to day whatever? How long is this construction going to actually take place? Well, at, at this point, you know, it's usually 30 to 40% faster with modules, but that's obviously a general a generalization. I would think this would be a, uh, an 18 month project built, stick built. So I would hope we could build it in 12 to 14 months, something like that. Uh, but it, you know, it depends on the contractor. Uh, this is something that uh, as we move ahead, we can, we can make those, uh, those estimates, we bring, we bring in a general contractor to work with and the general contractor works with the modular fellow. And, uh, you know, we can tighten things up on that and uh, work with the, uh, uh, the local authorities to, to tighten that up and, and have a real binding estimate. Thank you. Anything Thank further, you. Ms. Brown? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Aaron Freeberger. Hello, can you hear me? I can. I just have your name and address for the record. Yep, my name is Erin Freeberger. I live at 20 Parker Street. Thank you. And I have two questions. Um, the first one is, I've heard the applicants mention a few times, they've done a number of similar projects, and yet we're hearing quite a few um, vague statements, um, even around the specificity of things as direct and simple as rat control. So I have a specific question. If uh, we know if the applicants have experience, minimal or extensive in building on wetlands. And then I have a second question after that. Okay, uh, Ms. Noyes? Yeah, well, uh, Brookside is. <laughs> we, 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 um... We haven't, this, we, we don't intend to build in the wetland here to begin with. And uh, the most recent experience we have in, in building beside a, a flooding stream was uh, a few years ago and the, the, the stream did flood and we built the, the, the garage um, such that it was, it never has been a problem. And um, the raising the, the the rise of the groundwater has has was anticipated, and has not caused any issues. Excellent. So, with your experience by building next to the the wetlands, and you've addressed groundwater, um, in my research to better understand this issue, because I haven't heard some of these specificities in these meetings, I did. Um, 
some quick research to understand more about wetlands. And I'd like to share some of the things that I have learned. I think it's extremely important that we take a minute to understand exactly what we are building on and <laughs> excuse me, near. Mm -hmm. And that, as we know, once the land is being developed, whether it is one story or four, or you know, has more or less door trim, once we start building on it, um, it's gonna be at that point too late to have this understanding. So. I am short of a crystal ball of understanding exactly what the impact will be in the understanding of building on a wetland, but I do have science on my side. One of the things I've learned is that wetlands are the most biologically diverse of all ecosystems. That is more than the rainforest. What that includes is it has more animal diversity than any other biome in the world. Uh, rats obviously are residing there, but this week um, a bald eagle was spotted, spotted there as well. Half of all North American bird species use wetlands for feeding and nesting. A third of all threatened and endangered species are dependent on wetland habitat. Um, and more than 19,500 animals and plant species depend on wetlands for survival globally. So that's just around the diversity of the ecosystem. Wetlands are also natural water filters. They've been called the kidneys of the landscape. They neutralize harmful bacteria. They clean, filter, and store water. Um, they remove up to 60% of metals, um, hold up to 90% of sediment from runoff, and get uh, rid of 90, up to 90% of nitrogen. They also combat climate change. Wetlands can store up to 50 times more carbon compared to rainforests, helping to combat climate change. And then my final point here is that wetlands are the planet's sponge. We've talked a little bit about this in terms of preventing flooding and what we can do um, to help with that. This is also relevant in extreme events such as hurricanes and typhoons. According to the EPA, 1.5 million gallons of flood water are, can be stored on one acre of wetland. I believe you're proposing um, building on five acres of wetlands. Is that correct? No, that is not correct. Oh, um, I'm sorry, how much, how much are you building on? None. So oh, it's, it's okay, five, five acres. acres. Okay, fair, it's fair. Okay. Acres. Technically, it's not it's not classified as right. wetland because it's upland. It's above. Right. The... So to my previous point about the diversity of the animals, the bird species, the threatened and endangered species that are in the wetlands, let's hope that they are following this map and sticking to where they belong. Um, to that point, though, um, I do see how the town the town of Arlington has this opportunity to protect. These animals support the plant species, contain pollutants, neutralize harmful bacteria, combat climate change, and prevent flooding in the nearby neighborhoods. So with that preamble, my question is, we've heard consideration on flooding in the nearby neighbors. We've heard some minimal um, reaction to perhaps dealing with the rats. But my question is, has there been any consideration on the impact of the wildlife that would be in this area, endangered in other species, um, has there been any impact or understanding on the releasing of harmful heavy metals, um, any impact on climate change, and um, the effect that this would have um, on all those things, including perhaps humane ways of removing the bald eagle and other species, and perhaps we could release them into New Hampshire. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, John Hessian, can you address a little bit the question about the wildlife? I know there's a wildlife study that's a part of your work. Um, yes, I'd be happy to. Um, there, there is a wildlife habitat and vegetation um, evaluation that was completed uh, at the request of the Conservation Commission. I, I believe it is on the town's uh, Thorndike Place website, um, if folks on this meeting have not seen that. Um, and in, in very late person terms in a, a very short brief summary the 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 the, the, uh, the benefits of the existing habitat or the or the the quality of the existing wildlife habitat and vegetation on the site today is is marginal um, and much of that has to do with previous uh, disturbance on the site and, and actually today, most of it probably due to the, um, the homeless encampment that exists out there, their living arrangements and uh, materials that have been brought onto the site. Um, and then secondary to the homeless encampment and those impacts 
is the impact of invasive species on the area. But that's much better, um, you know, kind of summarized and outlined in our in our assess evaluation um, that was prepared uh, by one of our um, wildlife habitat biologists. Thank you, John. You're welcome. Um, Ms. Freeberger, do you have a further question? I mean, all of them, but no, <laughs> for this audience. Let's <laughs> show that to the private chat group. Um, OK, thank you. Um, next up is uh, GM Hakeem. Uh, yes, thank you very much. Um, I appreciate all the care and the time that the zoning board is uh, devoting to this and the fact that uh, people seem to be listening to the residents of the neighborhood. I mean, this, as, as we all know, this is almost universally opposed uh, by everyone that lives in town, um, as well as uh, the town, at least as far as I've heard. Um, for all of- Sorry to interrupt you, can I just ask for your address, sorry. Yeah, sorry, uh, 10 Edith Street. Thank you. Um, so, you know, you, we hear a lot about um, the, how much oak tree uh, claims to care about the environment and are the, all the environmental um, mitigation factors that they're going to undertake. Um, I mean, honestly, if they care that much about the environment, they would pick a different site to build. Uh, I think we can all agree that affordable housing is uh, something that is necessary, especially as we move into the future. I don't think anyone's debating that. Um, but, uh, you know, building, um, you know, I guess if you want to be sort of pedantic about it. it's not in a wetland, it's directly abutting a wetland and in any way that, you know, um, it's not an environmentally feasible place to build. Um, if they uh, want to show that they care about the environment as much as they claim they do, um, you know, they, they'll find another site to build. It's, uh, I think, I don't want to go on too long. We all understand um, what a terrible idea this is and, and the ramifications of that. Um, but I just want to be on record that, um, you know, it's, it's it's not fooling anybody to think, uh, to listen to the rhetoric um, that we're hearing from Oak Tree um, to say, oh, well, we care about the environment, we care about the environment. Um, you know, there, there are other sites um, that you can build on if that's really a main concern of yours. So thank you for listening. Thank you. Uh, next is uh, John, Eurowitz? Yes, can you hear me? I certainly can. Very good, my name is John Eurowitz. I live at 47 Mott Street for 36 years. I worked in the engineering profession for over 40 years. Uh, one thing that worries me dramatically is that it's kind of late in the game to not know for sure if you're gonna be driving piles for this project. If so, we risk damage to every house in the neighborhood, whether it be racking doors and windows, twisted roofs, chimney failures, foundation cracks, town service severing at the wall, okay? We can't do anything. If you're gonna drive piles, there's not much we can do about it except get you guys to get us insurance and cover us. But as an aside to all this, it's just one more bullet in the gun that shoots this project down. Nobody wants it, and piles would be a killer. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you. Um, whoops. Uh, Ms. Uh, Sylvia Dominguez. Hi, uh, my name is Sylvia Dominguez, and I am the town meeting member representing precinct four, which is right here. <clears throat> I need to find out uh, from um, the, the people here, how many of the houses in District 4 are going to have increased uh, flooding as a result of this? And um, um, also how will the rat infestation be controlled in District 4? I don't know anybody in my district that wants this and everybody is very upset about it. And um, I think I need to go back to them and let them know um, how many more of their, you know, how much often they're gonna be flooded. 
And um, also, um, I think that no matter what you say about this place, um, this is uh, um, it's just not a good thing to do in this area. This uh, building is way bigger than anything that surrounds it in Arlington. It doesn't look anything like anything else in Arlington in this area. So as the town meeting member of Precinct 4, could somebody tell me how much uh, more flooded uh, the houses in District 4 are gonna be? And can somebody also tell me about the rat infestation and what we will do about that? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Hessian, can you speak to localized flooding? So with respect to localized flooding, um, again, based on, you know, the, fee the current FEMA 100-year floodplain and the Arlington Wetland Bylaw requiring two to one compensatory flood storage. This project is, you know, filling some existing floodplain, um, but is also providing, you know, that two to one compensatory storage. So we'll be demonstrating that there will be no impacts to localized flooding. Um, on, the, on the larger scale, the, some of the conversations ab about you know, increased frequency of storm events and, and things like that. This neighborhood, you know, is in a low area and, and people experience it and they'll continue to experience it, but not anything um, as a direct result from this proposed project. Thank you. Um, could, could I uh, ask a question here? Um, yes, how is that possible that he can say that considering the fact that the, there's already flooding happening in this area and that people use their pumps on an ongoing basis. This doesn't make any sense. And I, I just don't believe that, okay? Mm -hmm. And if you're using measurements that you've used up until now, climate change is here, people. Climate change is here. Please listen to that, okay? I'm gonna go back to my district and tell them that they're how that nobody's telling us the truth and that nobody's uh, responding for the rats and nobody's responding for the added uh, flooding that's going to occur. Well, Mr. Dominguez, I believe what Mr. Heskin said, and he can correct me if I'm wrong, is he acknowledges that there is flooding that occurs today in this neighborhood. All he is saying is that the the level of flooding that this neighborhood sees today is going to be the same level that this neighborhood will see. Um, if this project is built, that the project will not increase the level of neighborhood flooding, but it won't do anything to alleviate the neighborhood flooding either. But why a... wouldn't it when you're saying that it's going to divert to the to El Wife Brook? I mean, El Wife Brook is right here. Okay, so I, I, I don't, I can't buy this. I'm sorry. This is not scientific. If this is, I mean, it doesn't take much to realize that we're surrounded here by water. I don't understand uh, why you're why we're agreeing to this, considering what is happening in this neighborhood, which is already flooding. I don't understand that. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, Matt McKinnon. Yes, my name is Matt McKinnon, and I live at 9 Little John Street. Please go ahead. I just have two questions. Uh, the first is if the town of Arlington or the ZBA could point us to a, a similarly sized project in a, in a neighborhood in Arlington, um, so we could you know, take a look at it and see what kind of good it would do for the town. Um, as of the Two largest projects I'm aware of is Arlington 360 and the Brigham site. Um, Rick, do you know the size of those projects? Or I don't know if there's anyone on from the planning department. So, uh, Mr. Chair, I believe oh, that that Arlington 360 was permit uh, was permitted with either 164 or 172 units. The Brigham development, I believe, is smaller, but I do not know the number offhand. 
um, you know, as a, as, and to throw a third project into the mix, uh, the legacy in Arlington Center is also a, uh, a fairly large apartment complex. Um, I believe it was built around 2000 or 2001. And we, do we don't these, have any uh, complexes. Uh, uh, do they have you know 200 car parking garages uh, accessing local neighborhood roads, or are they connecting up to larger avenues or uh, like you know, Massachusetts Avenue or, or or like a Link Street or a double leaned the legacy, road? Legacy in Arlington Center um, is on Mass Ave. Uh, the Brigham one is on Mill Street um, with a back way onto the little side street that feeds onto Mill Street that I can't remember the name of. And then Arlington 360 has an, a large access road from Summer Street, and I believe it has a, a rear access road that goes out on the local street network, but I don't remember the name of that, that okay. street either. I do not know how much parking those include, um, but neither of those were comprehensive permit applications. They were both um, uh, straightforward projects. I mean, all three were straightforward projects. Okay, thank you. I'd like to, uh, speaking of the comprehensive permit, is that the 40B permit? That is. I do have a question regarding the 40B permit for the ZBA, yep. if anybody could answer this question. Um, when reading about the 40B application process, I came across the, um, I believe it's a site review, uh, you know, site design review um, that they conduct to make sure that the development is situated in a community in a way that reflects the surrounding community in size and scope and height and proportions. Um, and you know, this project, when it was first submitted, included six townhouses uh, along Dorothy Road, with the apartment complex situated behind those townhouses, where. You know, looking at the townhouses, you can see where it, it would fit in the community um, and kind of hide the apartment complex behind it in a way. Um, but since the application was submitted in 2016, I believe, 2015, at the end of 2015, um, it's changed considerably where those six townhouses have now been removed. Uh, the apartment complex has been pushed forward onto Dorothy Street. Um, so I'm curious if there needs to be another design review. Uh, you know, I'm afraid this is like a bait and switch where we were shown one thing, it was approved, and, and now we're being shown something completely different. And that's, uh, that's my final question. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Mr. Haverty, is there any kind of a review at the state level in regards to um, the, the concerns that the, the previous speaker had? With regards to sort of a pre-review of the project in regards to the scale and density and its impact on the neighborhood. So when they get their eligibility letter, there is a review of sort of the density issues and the, the impact on the neighborhood. There's a design review process that they undertake, um, but it's rather informal and um, not super in depth. Um, so there's not really much of a, of a process to prevent a, an application from coming forward that a town may feel is overly dense. Um, they will look at sort of the relation to the neighboring properties. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, they're not so much looking for a way to stop a project from moving forward. They're looking for ways to allow a project to move forward. And Mr. Klein, Stephanie Kiefer, if oh, I may yes, just please. if I may just add on to um, what Paul has stated, um, just to somewhat give a, a further um, picture to the um, to the commenter. Once a project is approved by a zoning board, um, an applicant has to go back then to the subsidizing agency for what's known as final approval. So the project eligibility is the beginning of the process that that Paul referenced, but at the final approval stage, um, the applicant goes back um, with a, a number of documents, um, the affirmative um, fair housing marketing plan, et cetera, um, but also goes back and, and presents to the subsidizing agency um, project modifications that came along during the course. So it, 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 it somewhat does go full circle that 
the preliminary application, the project eligibility is submitted to the subsidizing agency. And then at the tail end of the process, I guess you could say, mm -hmm. um, final approval is sought of the subsidizing agency. And in, it's generally during that time that you, you demonstrate, um, you provide updated plans and show an, a narrative or a graphic form of the changes that occurred to the project during the course of the public hearing process. All right, thank you. And, and Mr. Chairman, to clarify, Attorney yeah. Kiefer is right that that is how the, the process will work. Um, all I will say is that the subsidizing agency will not do any sort of design review of the finally approved plans. Right. Um, that's only done during the project eligibility process. So they, you know, whatever the board issues for a decision, whatever plans the board um, eventually approves, if they do approve them, will be the, the final plans. The subsidizing agency won't make any changes to those. Okay, All right, thank you. Mr. McKinnon? Those were my final two questions, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chairman? Yes, please. This is, uh, this is Pat. Um, I noticed that it's getting to be here uh, about 10 after 10. Uh, I've been sort of holding back on a, on a question that I wanted to follow up on that was raised by somebody uh, earlier. I've, I've, I've not forgotten which, which speaker it was, but there was more than one. It has to do with, I, I would like very much before we're finished today, mm -hmm. for someone to just look, take the map or take the drawing and try to give us an idea of what it would look like to bring the trucks that we now are going to know are, are staged some distance away into the neighborhood where the boxes are gonna be put. We know that it's not exact, but a, a general sense because in the discussion, I just sort of have gotten lost in the words and think that the that just showing a picture would be great. So I'm not asking for that to be done right now, but I am hoping that it is done before we find that we have to adjourn for the evening. Ms. Kiefer, could you talk to Scott Thornton about preparing that? I can, yes. Thank you. Yes, and, and just to somewhat clarify um, some of the discussion with the, um, the construction process. Um, and I think this was raised at an earlier hearing, but um, obviously before the construction begins, there's a, a pre-construction meeting that would be with the general contractor, um, planning police department to, to work out the details, likewise of, of routes and whatnot. So um, Mr. Hanlon, to your, to your point and your question, um, I can work with um, Vanessa to, um, basically kind of like map out what the recommended or proposed would be, but it's it's a process that, you know, it would be working with the local officials to make certain that everybody's um, satisfied with, you know, the timing and, and you know, police details, et cetera. But um, we can work on that for you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Susan Stamps. Oh, hi, thanks. Um, thanks for the opportunity to say something. I appreciate the hearing. <clears throat> I have three questions. The first one is, I thought I heard Ms. Noyes say that the whole project would be affordable, but then I thought I heard um, Mr. Clipper say that it was going to be 20, 25% affordable, which is it? It's 25% at 80% of, AM, uh, of AMI. Okay. Yeah. And uh, Chairman Klein, if I may also chime in on that. Um, just to clarify for the 100%, um, in terms of the state, um, what they call the subsidized housing inventory. So it's it measures how close um, or, or where a municipality <clears throat> is in relation to the 10% affordability goal. Um, for a rental unit, all units would count. So 25% of them would be, would be priced as the chairman had suggested. Um, but in terms of the state's SHI, um, all 176 units count towards that. Oh, because they're all going to be rental, not a uh, homeowner? That's correct. Oh, okay. Well, that's good. Um, second question is, I used to work in West Concord and I was working there at the time that uh, this company, Oak Tree, built Brookside, um, I forget what it was called, Brookside Square or something like that in West Concord. I advise people to go out and look at it. Um, this schematic that they showed tonight was disappointingly similar to what they built in West Concord. 
with the square buildings um, with no imagination whatsoever. It totally didn't fit into the um, the kind of funky and um, aged um, small scale area in West Concord. And, and that looks like it's the same complete lack of imagination looking at this schematic. Um, also, there's a huge amount of blacktop in the Brookside development in West Concord. The whole place is a heat island. It's like walking through a desert, walking through that development. And it looks like it's going to be the same thing with this project, but maybe um, maybe the they could um, correct my impression of the project. Okay. Was there a third question or was that the three? Well, I mean, I was just wondering if they have any kind of response like, oh, this is gonna be like Concord because X, Y, Z. Yeah, Ms. Noyce, if you could just give a, just a brief, statement on separation just timing wise we're at 10 14 uh, we have our meeting until 10 30 so um, um very I, quickly please uh, i will respond to the heat island question um the, the the town of concord required that there be um a ground floor including office space and um the the office space requirement brought with it a parking requirement that um, we needed to uh, meet that was, uh, you know, it did require outside parking around the building and it was according to the, the ratio that the, the town required. Um, I should say that we did give back to the town uh, a, 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 an area of, of parkland which is being used by people um well and and um that was something okay. that we were able to do as far as your 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 concern about about the look of the building and taste um that's nobody can account for that we we get it we get many compliments and then there are clearly some people like you who don't particularly like it so um that's hard to hard to uh please everybody okay um very quickly trees how many trees do you expect to be taken down for this project? That's a job. Um, I don't know if Ms. Noyce can answer that or if that's a Mr. Hessian question. Um, we have not conducted a tree inventory to um, there. We've talked with the Conservation Commission about the commission requires a tree count for trees removed from a resource area. Um, and as this plan has evolved and we've re essentially requested the commission that we do that when the plan uh, is final, has been finalized, but um, there's been no tree count conducted to date. Well, it, it, are we talking five trees? 50 trees, I mean, just some estimate. No, I mean, there's clearly a signal, you know, we're, there's this, the development footprint of this project is approximately five acres, um, four and a half to five acres. So there, there are trees um, that will be, need to be removed to construct this project. We're probably talking about dozens, tens, maybe yeah. hundreds. Dozens. Dozens of trees. Okay. Uh, now the statement was made a few minutes ago that the there was a flood map that was done and that the project will not cause any more flooding. Um, but in fact, when you take trees down, tree roots hold water. And when you take trees down, that causes flooding. It happened to my, me personally and where I used to live in Carlisle, I backed up to a wetland. I took down two willow trees and I had two feet of water in my basement. It had been a dry basement for 30 years. Um, so have you done any um, discussion of the effect on flooding by taking down trees? Mr. Hessian? 
yeah, I'll, I'll kind of circle back to, you know, the, there's a performance standard for floodplain storage, floodplain impacts and, and compensatory storage for those impacts. Um, there's a standard under the Wetlands Protection Act and the town of Arlington has a more stringent requirement. And our design has taken both the state and the town of Arlington's performance standards into account. And we're providing a two to one compensatory storage volume for the floodplain um, impacts of the project. But I haven't heard any mention of the impact of removing the trees and their roots. So, um, which, and you're not saying that that was included. So I'm assuming it wasn't. No, there's, it, there's no, essentially the, the, the way that the removal of vegetation is really included in, in the analysis and design is in the stormwater management design. So mm -hmm. when you go from a land cover type of, you know, wooded um, to a impervious surface or a lawn area, you, it, it results in a higher um, runoff amount in the proposed condition compared to the existing condition. And then that's incorporated into the, um, stormwater management system sizing and design, but not in a uh, flood storage in the root structure of a tree per se, but it is accounted for, but not in, in the way that, um, maybe I didn't answer your, your, your initial question um, properly. All right, well, I'm not exactly sure what that, what that meant, but I, I think I've used up my time and I appreciate the answers, thank you. You're welcome. Um, so we do have till 1030 and I'm, I'm willing to push us right up to it, but um, I think we do still need to have a, a vote to con this, that this hearing will continue. Um, so we need to put a continuation into place. Um, so I was going to briefly move that the, that this, oh, I'll ask Mr. Haverty if I can do this. Can I, <laughs> can I vote to move the hearing as a continue the hearing to a date certain and then still accept people speaking now just so no. that I don't accidentally have the meeting cut out on us. Right, you, you can't vote uh, to continue the meeting and then continue to take additional comment. Okay. You can certainly set up a date <clears throat> and make sure that you vote on that date by 1029. Yeah, okay. All right, we'll do that then. And I'll go on to, uh, to the next on the list is Nicholas Ide. Yes, thank you. Uh, my name is Nicholas Ide. I live at 152 Lake Street, which is on the corner of Lake and Little John. Uh, I have a comment and a question um, and just some observations. I I've heard a lot of uh, statements tonight. I appreciate the opportunity for us to have this meeting, to learn, to speak, uh, all of that to share. Thank you very much for that opportunity. Uh, I've heard a lot of statements from the developers that they're not sure of this and they're not sure of that, but they are sure that we aren't going to have extra flooding in our basements, which I find very surprising. Uh, so I'm just making that observation. Uh, I am sure that my neighborhood will not look the same with a four-story monstrosity looming at the end of my street. I am absolutely 100% sure of that. Um, so, um, you know, sorry, that, that's, that's a fact. I'm sure of that. Um, on the question side, the question I have is about these modules. We brought that up a bunch of times. The developers have mentioned about staging areas. I don't care about the staging area. I don't understand how any size module that builds a building that size, it's, by the way, back there, it'll be, that I'll be able to see probably from my window, and I'm all the way at the Lake Street side, thank you very much. I don't understand how those modules are going, as other people have said, Mr. Hanlon included, how in the world that's going to come up Lake Street where there's no heavy trucking and come around the corner where it's a tight corner anyway and there are accidents that happen and do that for two years or 12 to 18 months. I, I'm, so I'm sorry, I'm sorry I'm a little agitated, but I just, I, I, it, it, it doesn't seem rational. It, it really doesn't seem like a rational project to me. And I think people are not being honest uh, with themselves about the way it's going to impact the people that live in this neighborhood, who love this neighborhood, who love this town. 
Uh, that is all. Thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, if I may uh, interrupt, it's Rick Valerelli, uh, Board yes, of sir. Administrator. Uh, we time out at 1030, which yep. does not give us much time. No, I know we will. We got five more minutes. I got one more name on the list. Um, so we'll do this quickly and then we'll vote to a, uh, continue. So um, Heather Keith Lucas. Hi, thank you so much. My name is Heather Keith Lucas. I'm a resident at 10 Mott Street. A couple of comments and I'll try to be brief. I'm thankful for my other neighbors who have raised such critical questions and concerns to this board tonight and I urge you to consider their points. I am deeply concerned about the health and safety of our neighborhood children. Our children currently ride their bikes in our streets in, in part because of the low volume of traffic we have and our neighbors currently are quite considerate with, with the kids in their bikes and, and being safe. Uh, construction for years will reduce the air quality in this neighborhood and their ability to run freely. Um, the safety of the children and my adult neighbors will be in jeopardy with a significant increase in traffic, not to mention the rats um, that need to be, would need to be addressed. And I'm not sure that that truly is being um, heard right now. Uh, we've already needed to pull up our garden this summer because of the rat problem. It is, it is significant. Um, I do question the safety of the intended residents of the proposed property. Oak Tree spoke that the intended population will include seniors and uh, potentially those in wheelchairs as well. I'm concerned um, specifically why it's okay to build a large development for low income senior population on a floodplain. We have flash flooding that happens on Dorothy Road now um, on a fairly regular basis. When it does happen, it happens very quickly. When that happens and someone who is physically disabled is stuck in the garage or in the elevator when that happens, I'm not sure um, what, what will happen, uh, what, what their safety will be. And it seems unconscionable from a social perspective to allow this building to be developed on a wetland where it does flood even for those who are not disabled, um, for those that are low income, their, their car is most like they're the most expensive valuable and that's gone once it floods. Anything further? Uh, not at this time. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, that was the last name on the list. We have under four minutes until we are timed out. Um, so with that, uh, uh, I will move that <clears throat> the board will continue this hearing um, in two weeks, which will be Tuesday, February 9th at 7.30 p.m. Um, may I have a second on that? Second. Second. Thank you, Mr. Mills. Uh, quick roll call vote. Mr. Hanlon? Aye. Mr. Mills? Aye. Mr. Ford? Aye. Mr. Revelak? Aye. Mr. O'Rourke? Aye. And the chair votes aye. So we are continued on Thorndike Place until Tuesday, February 9th at 7.30 p.m. Uh, that was the last item on our agenda. So thank you all for your participation in tonight's meeting of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals. I appreciate everyone's patience throughout the meeting. Especially wish to thank uh, Ruth Valarelli and Vincent Lee for all their assistance in preparing for and hosting this online meeting. Please note the purpose of the board's reporting for the meeting is to ensure the creation of accurate record of its proceedings. It is our understanding that the recording made by ACMI will be available on demand at acmi.tv within the coming days. If anyone has comments or recommendations, please send them via email to zba at town.arlington.ma.us. That email address is also listed on the ZBA website. All comments received will be included in the agenda for the forthcoming meeting. Uh, to conclude tonight's meeting, I'll ask for a motion to adjourn. So moved. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. Second. Second. Aye. Thank you, Mr. Mills. All board members in favor of adjournment, please say aye. 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 All opposed? We stand adjourned. Thank you all so much for your time this evening. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you.